everyone, it's Kimberly, and if you are just getting into the room, we will get started in just a few minutes. Uh, if you guys could give me a thumbs up that you can hear me. Uh, I am mic'd, so we should uh, have audio, and uh, I just put up the link again to the uh, instructions. Um, Louise, this is live right now, and you can go back and watch it this evening if you can't join us live. I did put up the link to the instructions, um, and I also put up a link to our comments sold page because I will be showing you different products today, and you can shop with me. If you are new with us, uh, we do run a, um, a comment sold website as well as a regular website, and if you want to be able to like shop from the products I'm going to show you as we're using them. You just click register and that and then you'll get a notification in your Facebook Messenger that you are um, linked up to my shop. So if everybody um, is getting their stuff together and getting all their supplies, we will get started in just a few minutes. And I'm going to put up this so that you know you're on the right page because that is what we're doing here uh, well in like a minute. So uh, I hope you guys are, are ready to go. If you are um, just going to follow along, that's fine too. Some of you I know are sewing with me today and some of you are just watching. So uh, again, um, the instructions are, are posted. Let me see if I can pin, pin the instructions. Okay, so I've pinned the instructions. So if you click on that link, that will take you over to um, the Stitching with Two Strings website, and that's the instructions that we're using today. So again, we're going to get started in just a minute. I want to give everybody a chance to kind of get their best press and their spray starch and get their sewing machine turned on, and, and then we'll go live. So this is what we're making this afternoon, and if you're joining us just now, uh, you're in the right place. I'm Kimberly, and we're going to be making this great little table topper. And uh, again, I've pinned the link um, to the page here. And then uh, I've also um, added in my comments sold page so that you can register on that so that you can shop from some of the products that I'm going to show you. You don't have to shop. I'm just letting you know that you can. And uh, hi, Nancy. So uh, thanks for joining me today, Nancy. I appreciate that. So I have a bit of a call. <laughs> I am getting over being sick, so um, just bear with me. I, I am mic'd up, so hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, I don't have Leah here to make sure that everything is loud enough, so usually Leah's here like telling me how loud I am. So anyway, so we'll just get started in just a minute, and I'll say a proper hello. And Judy, you should be... Oh, well, I haven't put it up just yet, Judy. So hold on one second. We're just doing the, the hello. So uh, we'll go ahead to the fabric cam. Okay, so there's the shop. And hi to everyone. So you're in the right place. Today we're going to be making a Valentine's table topper. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started in just a minute. I'm just giving everybody a chance to uh, get their supplies and uh, maybe something to drink. And... Uh, We'll go ahead and get started, and I did pin the instructions to the top of the page so that you can easily find them and follow along. This is a, not a, a difficult project. I think that beginners will still be able to do this project. It's pretty simple, and uh, we'll have something fun for Valentine's Day when we're done there. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, click us over to the camera that's going to be focusing on the machine. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and type them up. and. Um, if I'm going too fast, definitely let me know. And if you're uh, if you're already registered on our comments sold page, you're in good shape. If you need to register, just type register. It should register your account. Um, and that way you can shop from the different things that I'm showing you today if you're interested in buying something. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to go ahead and put us back over. All right, there's our close-up camera. And... Okay. Hi, Pauline. Hello from the UK. Wow, that's fantastic. Judy, thank you for letting me know that you guys can hear me. And hi, Joyce. I'm going to say hello to a couple people here. Hello, Karen from Foxborough, Wisconsin, where it's snowing. I envy you. I like snow. We have some snow on the ground here in Pennsylvania. Um, 
but uh, I, I do like a snowy day. We actually have sunshine today, so that's always a, a pleasant thing. Because uh, typically in Pennsylvania, the side of the state, we don't get much for snow uh, or sunshine. I mean, uh, we have a lot of like overcast days. So um, basically, I'm going to turn my computer. You can't see what I'm doing right now, but I'm going to turn this so I can see comments. And um, hi, Pat. Thanks for joining us today. And Fran, good to see you. I don't know if Carol's on, but I, I am. Uh, I. I would be surprised if she wasn't. I just haven't looked there yet. So anyway, uh, I'm going to be showing you different products as we're sewing. And hi, Donna, how are you doing? Um, and as we go along, if you want to purchase one of those products, I will be like sharing with you um, like like this little paper here that, hold on, I'm on the wrong screen. Okay, so here I'd put up like this paper and we're going to talk about these marking pencils. And if you wanted to purchase that, you would comment the word sold, the word mark, and that would put that in your cart. So let's, I guess, go over how to shop because um, there are some products that you guys might want to purchase. And uh, so basically, you're just going to type register in the in the comments for right now. And then um, shipping is always $5, uh, up to $75. And then once you hit $75, it's free shipping. So you would type the word um sold and then whatever name I've assigned to it and then um, that will put that into your cart. So if you're new with us and you want to register just type register and that should work. We'll go back here to the close-up cam and I'm going to move this over so I can read what I'm seeing with you guys. Oh there's Carol. Hi Carol how are you? Uh, what is the motor ruler you have on the bed of the machine? That is a um, little six inch ruler that Moda sent us as a freebie and it has a quarter inch line on it that I'm using. I will talk about like how we're going to make sure that we're at a quarter inch. So um, it's just something I use for my quarter inch seam allowance. You probably have a ruler in your possession that's little that you can make sure that you line up your needle. Um, so we'll definitely... Uh... Hi Sharon, how are you? make sure that you are at a quarter inch, but we'll definitely talk about that in just a second. So people are still getting registered. I just want to give everybody a chance to kind of get themselves kind of settled and in place. And yes, okay. So now to be honest with you, I have not done a live class on Facebook Live. I've just done my Friday night shows and um, I usually have Leah here helping me. Uh, but it's a class today, so she's in school, I'm doing this, and you got me by myself, so there won't be a comic relief, my apologies. However, um, we're going to go through this together. I have allotted about two hours for this class so that you guys um, don't need to feel rushed if you are sewing along with me. Um, if you're just watching, cool, hang out, watch us sew this cool little project. I have pinned the project. Um, Yes, Pat, if you leave in the middle of this, we'll be up and available later on so you can watch later. If you have to exit for some reason or you're at work and you're not supposed to be watching this right now, uh, yes, then um, you can watch it later. So anyway, I have pinned the instructions uh, from Stitching with Two Strings up on um, the link here. And um, that way you can get the instructions. There is not a PDF download for this. This is a follow along off of her, her website. So I <clears throat> did not have a PDF available. Now for next week's class, we do have a PDF for the mug rug that we'll be doing that does have a PDF. So um, you have to just uh, kind of follow along and, and watch her instructions as, or not watch, but follow along with the instructions as we go through them so that um, you can see uh, how, how this goes and we should do fine. So. All right, so a couple things I want to share with you first. Um, things I will be going and we'll talk more about. Um, if you are new to quilting and uh, this is like a first time that you're actually making a project or you are have been sewing for a while and you're like, oh, this looks like something fun and cute for my house. That's awesome. I'm glad you're here. Um, the quilting uh, has some basic rules to it. We press in quilting with a hot iron. We don't iron like clothing. We'll go over pressing technique today. We're going to talk about quarter inch seam allowances. We'll talk about thread, needles, uh, proper uh, proper technique as well as sitting properly. Um, so I, I want to, usually when I teach classes, I go over a lot of 
things that maybe you're not thinking about, like slouching, sitting up straight, deep breaths, all those kinds of things, because uh, ergonomics is extremely important uh, in quilting or in any sewing, actually. Sitting at the machine properly is important. So make sure that you're comfortable, you're level, um, your feet are on the floor. <laughs> now I say that, but I'm in a, I'm in a bar stool today because I'm on my cutting table. However, typically your feet should be flat on the floor. You should have shoes on because people have drop scissors and I won't need to go into details what happens when they drop scissors, but it's usually never good. So basically um, you're gonna wanna make sure that you are comfortable and have uh, proper, you know, proper technique. Hi Leah, there you are. You're supposed to be in class, I thought. So thank you, Fran, I appreciate that. So um, yeah, so we're, Leah, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear, like if you think uh, you can hear me just fine because I'm not quite sure if they can hear me and I've been sick and my ears and all that kind of cool stuff. So I don't want to be shouting at them. So anyway, um, have you got the tape that shows one quarter and could be put on a machine base? Linda, I do not have that tape. I don't like taping my machines. Um, it drives me nuts. I know it's a removable peel and stick and all those cool things. I, I just can't stand any adhesives on my machines. So no, I don't. Thank you, Leah. Okay. So um, if you don't mind that, that's cool. I just don't sell the tape because like I said, I don't like it, but um, you know, that's just me. So anyway, so yeah, so we're going to talk about like all cool things. So uh, one of the things I want to share with you first um, is we do have this handy quilting basics pocket guide. And for those of you that, like I said, are new to quilting, this is a really nice little easy, uh, it folds out, it's laminated. It talks about everything uh, from sewing strip sets to chain piecing to pressing. Uh, it's a really handy little reference. So we do have these available in the store. And if you are interested in one of these, they're only $4.99 and you'll comment the word quilt and uh, that will put that into your cart. So it is a, a really good beginner uh, pocket guide. It even has this like handy dandy little like ruler on the side here. You could take it to class with you. Um, if you're in a class and you're too embarrassed to ask a question, you can always pull this open and it will tell you um, you know, about rotary cutting and maybe if you had a question in there while you're in a class. So it's a great little handy guide. I just wanted to get that out of the way and show that to you. The other thing we're going to be um, using today is our magnetic pin bowl. So this is fantastic because I'm not going to have pins all over the floor. And um, we do have these available in different colors. And, uh, and I will go through this again at the end. But if you're needing a magnetic pin bowl and you want to take something like that to class, or if you're just sick and tired of picking pins up off the floor, uh, or your husband seems to find them with his feet, I don't know why he would be in my sewing room in bare feet. However, uh, if your husband finds lots of pins on the floor, these are really nice to have. So you, if, if you need a magnetic one, we um, sell them and it's called grab. You'll comment the word sold grab, and then you can choose a color. I have them in black, purple, red, yellow, and teal. And we'll go through, like I said, through that at the end. So we'll be using a magnetic pin bowl today. Uh, we'll be using our Soline ceramic pencil. We'll talk about this. Uh, we have our storks because next to a sewing machine, I don't keep eight inch blades. I keep like more snips. So we have our, our storks. We'll talk about them. And then uh, we have our stash and store ready to go to hold all my my things so things aren't flying off the table. And then we also have our mini stripology ruler, which we'll be using in class to square up our things um, so that we know that we're being accurate today because accuracy in quilting is extremely important. And we'll go through how all these things work. So that being said, I don't see any questions that have come up. So I think we will uh, go ahead and uh, get started. I'm not a fast teacher. I kind of overthink everything, so bear with me. And I can see that I have forgotten to plug in my urn, so I will plug that in while, while we get started. If you are, um, again, new to quilting, quilting requires ironing. It's just one of those facts of life that we, we must iron in order for things to come out properly. And, okay, so we're on a cotton setting on our urn. I do have my handy dandy best press with us today. Uh, I'm a best press fan, have been for years. If you like spray starch, fantastic. What are the differences? Some of you that are new, like I said, might have some questions here. Hi, Sandy. Um, hi, Mary. So best press, unlike spray starch, uh, does not leave 
flakes on the fabric. Um, once you hit it with the iron, a lot of times starch will have these fun sticky flakes and make a mess. Um, the best press doesn't do that, and uh, you still get a very crisp, um, crisp piece of fabric when you're done pressing with the best press. Some people uh, enjoy using like stay flow starch or sizing. That, that's fine. If you are a stay flow or sizing fan, I have like no problem with that. Uh, it's whatever you prefer. I just like the best press because um, I don't have any sticky residue and um, it just seems to make my stuff come out just fine. Now a lot of people also ask, did we wash our fabric before we started? No. Um, I am not a fabric washer except for when I'm making like clothing or yeah, clothing. So basically uh, everything you're seeing today is off the bolt and has just been cut and we're going to press as we go. I did do some pressing before I, I cut because um, I did pre-cut everything because otherwise we'd never get through this class in two hours. However, that being said, I will be pressing and spraying with the best press again as we go through because, um, like I said, like fabric needs to kind of be stiff when you're doing things in order for everything to come out right. And uh, basically, uh, the... Uh, mat that you see here is my wool pressing mat. We do have those for sale. I'll show that to you later. And underneath of this, because I, if you notice I'm on my cutting mat, I do have a piece of cardboard. So when I'm pressing, I'm not going to be uh, warping my cutting mat today. So yeah, if you are ever on a cutting mat and you have your wool mat and that's on top of there, just make sure that you uh, protect that surface because the, the, the heat from the iron will warp your cutting mat. So do not think I'm pressing straight from my wool mat onto my cutting table. I not, I do have a piece of cardboard here. So, uh, you know, definitely protect your cutting mat surface. Uh, right, so we have our sewing machine, which is set up. Um, I have an Elna, I used to sell Elnas. So you're looking at my Elna today. And uh, we are using the, Mettler brand of quilting thread, uh, size 40. I know that like some of you guys get really like into your thread weights and everything, and that's cool. So uh, it's our size 40, which is not the thinnest thread. However, it's also not the thickest thread. I like Mettler brand. I think it sews really nice in the sewing machines. It's also what I have in the bobbin, same weight. And uh, the needle I'm using is a chrome needle from from Schmetz. So there's my pack of needles and we do have these available for sale. If you are interested, how come? Okay, there we go. If you are needing 8012 needles, that's the size we're using because that's the size I like for quilting um, or for piecing, I should say, because that's what we're doing today is we're piecing. And if you are interested and you need chrome needles, you would comment sold uh, pack, P-A-C-K, and that gives you a pack of 10 uh, chrome needles. Now you might be asking yourself, why are we using chrome needles? Uh, chrome needles tend to do really well going through starched seams and um, we it just kind of tends to, oh what's the word I'm looking for here, um, they just kind of glide through. You can really benefit with chrome needles on batiks and, and not that any of my pieces today are batik, However, if you are a batik fan and you use a lot of batik materials, a chrome needle is definitely the way to go. They are new from Schmetz. They've only been out about a year. And um, I'm not saying that your the regular standard Schmetz 8012 isn't any good. They are. However, I like the chrome. I think they're neat. And um, I prefer using them because every once in a while I do come across batik fabrics. So we'll be using that in our needle. And I'm going to move a couple things out of the way here so I can kind of point. So I'm going to slide this forward so you guys can actually see what's going on. So you can see here I have a ruler stuck underneath the uh, presser foot. And I my presser foot does have a side um, slot, or not slot, like a guide on it. Uh, it's just kind of the way Elna built this quarter inch presser foot. If you do not have a guide, there are many products on the market that you can like put down. Somebody was asking earlier. Uh, about the tapes that you can set here so that you have a guide uh, that's fine too. Some places have like these little like silicone things that you can set there. I just have a guide on my foot. I know they make a lot of these feet that have guides so that you can uh, not have to stick things to your throat plate but if you feel like 
that's um, not for you, that's okay. So I've already gone ahead and made sure that my needle is coming down a quarter inch um, in from the edge of this presser foot. And uh, that way I know I have an accurate seam. Now the question always comes up, are we doing scant quarter inch? Uh, I am not doing scant quarter inch because I plan on um, pressing my seams to the side in most instances. It kind of depends on how many intersections of seams that I'm going at. Uh, so I'm not doing a scant today. However, if you want to sew as a scant, maybe your thread is thicker than mine and you're concerned about uh, that happening where you press your seams and the block isn't coming out exactly like it should be, you can try for a scant, which is like one more needle or click over from the quarter inch. But quarter inch is highly recommended. So not three eighths, don't go to four eighths. We're not sewing clothing, you know, that kind of thing, which is five eighths anyway. However, uh, make sure that you are set up for a quarter inch and that's extremely important. Accuracy is everything in quilting and um, we're going to want to make sure that you're successful. Now, if you start with the instructions from uh, the beginning, you know that we are going to be marking uh, two inch squares. Okay, so we have two inch squares that we're going to be uh, marking because we're going to be making uh, them into we're going to be sewing two pieces together and then cutting that and flipping that open and pressing so that we have cute little squares so um, if you want to go ahead and grab your two inch squares we're going to show you how to mark those properly and then that way uh, and then we'll talk about sewing them down so and i should back up and say that when we do this first step we're actually not sewing a quarter inch seam we're going to be sewing right on the line but the quarter inch seam is going to come in uh, in the next steps after this one. So in this one in the beginning you're not following a quarter inch seam allowance, you're just sewing on the line. So let me show you how we're gonna mark this. Um, I have my uh, sew line pencil here and uh, now we're gonna talk about sew line pencils for just a second because many of you may not be familiar with what this is. This is, if I can get it into the camera, there it is. This is a ceramic lead so it's not a um, Okay, ceramic lead is kind of like a weird way of saying ceramic pencil, but basically we are going to use this because one, uh, it has a gold um, gold lead or ceramic lead in it so that I can see what I'm doing because if I was going to mark this with, let's say this was darker, like a black fabric, this then pencil would come up really well and um, it really is very smooth and there's nothing worse than trying to draw on a piece of fabric with a lead pencil and it kind of gets caught across as you're, you're drawing the line. So if you find that you're using a lead pencil and it's very annoying, a ceramic pencil is probably for you. So um, we're going to be using our ceramic pencil and then I have my uh, quick quarter which some of you are familiar with, some of you may not be, but this is a tool that uh, we use in a lot of our classes. Basically we use it a lot when we're drawing on either side of the tool. Today I'm just going to be using um, the tool to draw the straight line from corner to corner. So we're going to be doing this uh, I believe it's 16 times, so if you want to go ahead and get out your squares, we're going to go ahead and and uh, draw our quarter inch, or not quarter inch, we're just drawing a straight line from corner to corner, okay? If you don't need, if you don't have a tool and you just want to use a regular ruler, same concept, you're just going to uh, put that ruler down and then just draw a line, okay? The point here is that you're drawing from corner to corner, okay? Make sure it's nice and straight, all right? Now, for those of you that are not on, that are not here, standing here, you can't see my yellow line, but I wanted to show you the ceramic pencil because it's pretty cool. And now at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to bring this over to the machine, and we're going to sew that that straight line, um, just like this. Okay. So we have our line. Now, if uh, you're going to be doing this like a bunch of times, you're going to want to chain piece those. And for those of you that don't know what chain piecing is, chain piecing is where you're going to take a bunch of those and sew them end to end. And I will be demoing that here now shortly. Okay. So the pencil disappears with the heat. The pencil, um, it does not disappear with the heat. That is a friction pen. This one you can remove with a, uh, like a, a very, um, damp washcloth. So if you're on the front of a quilt and you're marking, you can wipe that away with a washcloth. It's not a heat soluble um, pen 
and I wouldn't call it quite water soluble, however, um, the line uh, can be wiped away. So for the t since we're in class and uh, I don't want to spend forever marking every one of these little squares, uh, I've gone ahead and I cut mine, all right, some of you are going to be like, that's just not fair. I cut my squares into rectangles on my, um, my go, my baby go, so that um, I can just sit there and sew and not have to spend the extra time cutting off. So I'm going to go ahead and chain piece my blocks so you guys can follow along. And I have to reset this because it moved um, from when I started sewing. So you're going to see me move my back. My apologies. Ever do that, like where you change something on your sewing machine and then you start to sew and it moves again? It's like very annoying. All right, so we're back to our quarter inch seam. So basically, you're going to be, I'm going to be sewing my triangles. You're going to be sewing on your line. And basically, chain piecing at this point means that, and you guys can see what I'm doing. Okay, just making sure. I don't want to have a bad camera angle here. So basically, I'm just going to lift slightly to press her foot. And truth be told, your throat plate right now, if you have a machine that has the options for different throat plates, your throat plate could um, just be using the one with the single hole. Mine is set up for the embroidery machine. Um, so the problem with that is the fact that my thread could pull my fabric into the throat plate right now. But we're just going to keep going because, you know, right now it's not causing a problem. So this is chain piecing. So right now I have, see how there's a chain? That's what they call by, that's what they mean by chain piecing. So we're going to keep going because we have to make, um, like I said, 16 uh, of these different little things. And when you get one of yours done, what you're going to do, okay, is you're going to cut away okay that portion right there that's what you're going to be doing on yours and then it'll be open up and we're going to be pressing that and we're going to get to that step in just a second so if you've got your square one of your squares done that's what they mean by cut away a quarter inch from the sewn line all right so that's what yours is going to look like in just a minute all i did was i skipped that step and am sewing on uh, my triangles okay because Again, I don't want to spend all afternoon cutting uh, these, these squares away. So we're just going to keep going here. Hopefully your machine has been cleaned after since after Christmas. I know many of you um, sew a lot for Christmas time. Uh, and then in January, you want to sew for yourself. And uh, just make sure that you've taken that throat plate off and give it a good dusting that way uh, it's ready to go you should be changing your needles after every big project I know many of you um, don't like changing needles um, for whatever reason I know there's a multitude of reasons however you should be changing your needles out uh, frequently because um, a dull needle does not help the quilting process so I, I'm getting an error about my bobbin, just ignore, it's, nothing's wrong, it's just my machine. So anyway, how are we all doing so far? We're doing okay. So we're going to keep chain piecing these. Again, we have our 8012 needle in, we have our 40 weight Mettler thread, okay, and we're going to keep chaining. Now your blocks, you're chaining too, you're just, uh, yours just looks a hair bit different than mine because I pre-cut mine on my go, which is one of the cool things about having a go, but I understand not everybody has one, but I'm not doing anything different than what you should be doing right now. So I'm going to keep moving along here. Okay, almost done. Hopefully I'm not bouncing the camera as I'm sewing this. And in a minute we're going to talk about pressing these because we want to make sure that our little squares are nice and perfect. A couple more. This is really not a difficult project and like I said if you're a beginner and you're just new to to quilting this is actually a good project to do because you're not 
um, having to deal with a lot of unusual shapes. We're basically just dealing with squares and rectangles today. So um, nothing scary there. It's just a uh, process. All right, so we got all these chained. All right, look how fun that was. How cool was that? All right, are we there? Are you guys with me? Got that? I'm assuming that you guys are right along. Okay, so at this point, my iron, just make sure that it's hot. Okay, again, I'm on my wool pressing mat, and I love my wool pressing mat for a lot of reasons, because as I'm pressing, the heat from the wool is pushing back up onto my cotton surface, and I'm getting almost like a double exposure. I, I guess that's best, the only way I can explain that. Um, oh, and I should mention my stitch length today is a 2.8. Um, I don't sew at a 2.2 unless I'm doing some other things. 2.8 means that I'm not going to spend all afternoon sewing, but it's yet not a basting stitch, which we shouldn't be basting because we're quilting. However, uh, I am at a 2.8. I know some of you guys get like all sorts of crazy about what is our stitch length and, and all that. And stitch length is important. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying like, we're not basting. Okay, so at this point, uh, I have my squares, or well, they're going to be squares in just a second. There we go. And um, one of the things that most people tend to skip when they're quilting is setting the seam. And for some reason, um, this is like extremely important. I know why it's important. It's because it's shrinking the thread. But we want to set the seam on our squares before we open them up and press them open. That shrinks that thread down so that it is all um, now uniform with the fabric. So I've, I've hit that with the hot iron, okay? And if you want to give that a little little spray with your best press at this point, you can give that a little spray, but we're gonna, we're gonna press that. Now notice I'm not ironing back and forth, okay? Very, very important not to iron. Um, we are not making clothing. We are not making, uh, we're not taking stuff out of the dryer right now. We are, we are pressing. Quilting is a, an emotion that you push down and you lift. You do not go back and forth with the iron. That is the fastest way to get your blocks all askew. Okay? So now at this point, I've set my seam. I'm going to open that up. Okay? Now, this is the other million dollar question. Do we press the seam open or do we press to the dark side? Okay? Well, Today we're going to, if you want to press open, because I know some of you um, are very much into pressing seams open, I'm, I'm good for that. I think that's fantastic. Uh, so if you want to press open, this is how you do that. You're going to sit there and you're going to push that open. You're going to finger press that seam open, just like this. So we're going to, we're going to press that open that way. Okay, I'm just showing for everybody who's wondering what pressing a seam open looks like. And then we're going to press that down. Okay, so that seam is pressed open, all right. However, if you don't want to do it that way and you want to press to the dark, at this point, you're going to open that seam up. Okay, we're going to set the seam. Don't forget to set your seam. Very, very important, okay. And then at this point, we're going to open that seam up. I always give it a good finger press. Try not to burn your fingers. And then you're going to press there, all right. So that is pressing to the side. Notice how it's not an open seam, but it's pressed towards the dark, all right, and it's still open, all right. So then I'm going to press and give that a good press. And again, we are not iron, not doing this motion. No, 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 all right. So we have two blocks, and we're just going to go through now. I am going to hit these guys with some spray starch. Uh, because I like a lot of spray starch in my my projects. It's just me. If you don't, that's okay. A fabric already comes with sizing in it. And when you wash it, you take that out. Uh, if you are a quilter that washes. But make sure that you put it back in. Because uh, it's extremely important that uh, you have stiff fabric. So again, I'm going to open these up. I'm going to give it a press. All right, and I'm going to set this off to the side. All right, so we're going to go through that. And I think you can understand now why I pre-cut my, uh, my fabrics because 
I think some of you are probably just finishing up your chain piecing and cutting. And um, for those of you that are just watching, uh, you can just keep watching, I guess. Do we have any questions? Is there a benefit of pressing seams open? Yes, there is a benefit to pressing seams open. Pressing seams open, um, this comes from a, a one of my uh, instructors uh, that used to teach in my shop, because I asked her the question one day, I'm like, why do we press open? If you have a quilt with a lot of seams, um, pressing them open tends to take and reduce all that bulk. So if you have an intersection of six, four, six seams, it, tend, it tends to get really bulky. So pressing them open keeps that, keeps that bulk from just becoming so massive at that intersection. So uh, there is a benefit to that. If you have um, something with only one or two seams intersecting, no big deal. You can press the side, and we're going to show you um, nesting in just a minute so that you can understand um, bulk because that is one of those things where people get frustrated with their quilting because they're running into this bulk issue in their seams and their needles fighting with them their stuff isn't making good points they're not lining things are not lining up very nicely so yeah there is a benefit to pressing seams open and again some of it and you know that like Modern times, we do modern things, and it's all, you know, all everybody's pressing to the dark. Yeah, and that's fine. I, and I think with some of that, it's fine. However, I have found that too many intersections, and it doesn't become fine anymore. It becomes a bulky nightmare. So, but for now, we're just doing, uh, we're not going to have a lot of seams in this step, so we're okay. But that's what we're doing. All right. So how's everybody? Is everybody doing okay? We all following along just fine. Hopefully. Okay. We're going to just kind of keep going here. I know some of you had to work today, and uh, but you can go back and watch it. And it will leave it up. Okay. And notice I'm not using any high-speed iron. Um, I know that some of you guys have your travel irons. That's cool. Whatever you like that makes a very good... Uh, see a good press and that's not sputtering so uh, most of you know this but if you are using any type of steam in your iron I'm using a dry iron okay but if you are using water in your iron make sure you use distilled water because that way um, it doesn't rust out the inside of the iron and uh, regular tap water will tend to do that and then if you're steaming to get your your stuff crisp you'll notice that it sputters uh, and you might end up with rust spots on your fabric. And that is like the biggest bummer when you are quilting along and your iron decides to thwart your attempts to, to make nice, nice, beautiful quilts because it decides to spit all over your fabric. So I'm a dry iron kind of girl myself. Um, that's why I use some other component like Best Press to make my seams nice and flat. Okay, so a couple more here couple more and now let's talk about the fabric too like some of you are um, using from your stashes obviously because I did not send out a kit for this because I figured you all can figure out your own pinks and reds and holiday things and um, because probably you have a little bit of a stash of these things however we're uh, we are using quilt shop quality fabric um, it has a higher thread count than our big box retailer friends and um, so we're going to get really good seams um, and our fabric isn't going to stretch and our fabric isn't going to fade as quickly because our uh, fabric has a higher thread count. So it's kind of, I always tell people, it's kind of like the difference between like 150 thread count sheets and 600 thread count sheets. You have a bigger, more thread count, that dye is going to be locked in there a lot better. We're not going to have a stretching issue, and then when you go to, let's say uh, you're using this as the table topper, and somebody spills a drink on it or whatever, you can still throw this in the wash machine, wash it up when you're done, and if you use really good quality fabrics, you're going to have no issues with washing, washing this. Okay, so we have all our our happy little blocks are now pressed. Okay, and hopefully you are at the same point that I'm at. And now one of the things, if you notice the instructions, is that um, 
they used uh, coordinating fabrics for the next part. And basically what they did, let me go over to where she is here because I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip over here just for the mouse turned off. That's always nice when the mouse does that. Okay, so at this point, we've got everything pressed and we're gonna take our matching square and um, we're going to put that together with our, our, our little uh, half square triangle blocks. So our blocks should measure two, and a, two inches right now, which they do. And um, one of the things that we're going to do to do this is we're going to take, all right, where am I? I lost my own picture. We're back, okay, now I can see you guys. There's nothing worse than losing, all right. So, here's my coordinating block, all right, and I'm going to coordinate that with my pieces I just pressed, all right. So I'm going to make a piece that looks like that. I'm going to make a whole, a whole little section. Now I have not gone ahead and pressed the matching squares, so I'm going to give them a quick press. Now, if your squares don't match to um, your half square triangle blocks, that's okay. They don't have to. This is your project. If you want to use nothing but bright blue for your little intersections, knock yourself out. I think that's just fine. Um, some of you guys are really talented with your color choices and you're very artistic and I think that's just fine. So I did match mine because um, that's what she said to do and I try to tend to follow directions. But if you don't want to follow directions, we're not going to judge. So at this point, my little blocks are, have been pressed. Notice that we didn't do the, the crazy eyes back and forth pressing. And we're going to make these little units. Okay, and like I said, I'll show it to you again. Uh, many of us are very visual people. And we need to see every step laid out just every single time. So we're going to be doing that. All right. This is our lobe to our heart. All right, this is what she calls the lobe section. So this is how that's gonna look. So I'm gonna grab my handy dandy pin and I'm going to pin these together. All right. You'll be like, oh, I don't really need to pin that. Well, that's okay, you don't have to. I like, I like to help have a pin help, especially for the first part because I find that if I don't pin the very first one, then I have flipped something and I end up doing it twice. So, cause sometimes the movement from the cuttings from the mat to the machine, it can be just as simple as just taking that one small movement and next thing you know, um, you've turned this into this. And if you notice in her instructions, she actually did that. And I thought that was kind of cute. So uh, usually for the first one, I make sure that I completely pin that first one in and then from there, I'm visually able to see that I have the other one. If you want to pin every single one of your blocks because you are comfortable pinning, I think that's just fine. Um, I tend to pull my pins when I when I sew. Um, it and I'll tell you what base what makes that decision I base that decision on is whether the pin is thick or thin. If I have a very thin pin, I feel confident uh, of sewing over it, I will. If I have a thicker pin, I won't. Um, it's a weird thing, I know, but that's just me. So I'm going to put all my little units together now. I'm going to make all my little lobes, okay? And um, that way they're all set. So basically when we're quilting, we're working in almost like a factory kind of we're going to do all this unit first and then we're going to do all this unit next is so that everything is uh, moving along. I'm not jumping back and forth in my directions between making the nine patch and then making a lobe for it and then making, we're not doing that. We're going to do all our lobes just like we did all our initial half square triangle units. Okay. So that's basically this next process. So I'm going to set this off to the side because I'm also going to press all in one at one time. I'm not going to stop and press and stop and press. So uh, we're gonna take our next one. And again, you go over there. 
we're going to lay these out so that we can visually see exactly like what we're supposed to have okay and again I know that many of you are very visual I've taught many of you and and we have to see the process laid out before us so I'm going to grab one of my magnetic pins here I'm going to line this up and the starch has really helped lock these pieces of fabric together I'm dealing with more like a stiff board than a flimsy piece of fabric. So if you um, have not pressed or added any starch, that's okay. However, I, I think that you'll be happy adding a little bit of starch in there. So again, I'm going to press through this to this. Okay. And hopefully I'm not going too fast. Hopefully you're right along with me, those that are sewing along. Okay. And um, Again, if you choose to pull, pull your pin, that is fine. You don't have to, you can sew right over it. Now, I will tell you, because I have run into this as well, if you are not pulling your pins and your needle hits the pin, take a moment and take the needle out of the machine and lay that machine on, uh, needle on a flat surface and look to see if you have bent that needle. It doesn't take a lot, a lot to bend a needle and sometimes you guys do it and you don't realize you've done it and next thing you know your 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 seams don't look right your stitching's all out of whack the machine's making funny noises um, it doesn't take a whole lot to bend that needle tip or break it off so fair warning if you hit that if you hit a pin check your needle it is it's very important okay so we're going to keep making our lobes here all right just Putting them all together. And again, if you're a new quilter, this is this is just a, a you might not be as far along as what I am right now. Don't get frustrated. Um, it's it a, it's a new hobby, and um, you might be uh, you know slow, and and it, you're supposed to be slow. This is, uh, quilting is not a fast process, especially in the beginning when you're trying to just get everything. Uh, right and it takes a little time it's it's a it's a definitely a skill set uh, that needs time to develop so I know that sometimes people get frustrated because they think they should be further along than what they are you don't need to be frustrated we're just making little little hearts today so So hopefully your sewing is coming along nicely and you are you're about where I'm at so we're making our lobes for our hearts so right now this is what you what our hearts should be looking like and we'll press those in just a few minutes and okay, so we'll keep going here and again we'll go over the different products that that we're using we will go over them a little we'll take a little break we'll go over them so that you guys um, can have some of the things that I have here that help make life go nicely all right pin yeah magnetic pin bowls um I don't know what it is but my husband has the knack for walking into my sewing room and finding every possible pin I ever dropped and it can be like I don't even know like how a pin has has moved from where my sewing machine is to like 10 feet away but they seem to travel it's, and uh, he, he tends to find them but and I appreciate his efforts in helping find those pins because you know God forbid if the dog steps on one that would really be bad I'd rather not have my dog step on a pin my husband's a tough guy I'd rather have him Okay, I am joking. I don't want anybody stepping on pins. However, I don't want my dog chewing pins either, so that'd be like a trip to the vet, and that wouldn't be cool. So, uh, I know that some of you have uh, dogs that are fun, and they'll chew, like, spools of thread for you. Uh, I have seen pictures and heard stories. Never cool. <laughs> so, okay, what uh, go set size did you use for your triangle? Okay, so, Sandra, I had... The inch and a half Hasker triangle die, uh, it cuts four 
uh, rectangles at, not rectangles, triangles, sorry, at a time. So that was the inch and a half because when you sew two and inch and a halfs together, um, that's what it's going to finish at. All right. That's the one I used. All right. So we got that lobe done. That lobe is done. Last set of lobes. And yes, like I said, your machines should be fairly clean. Um, if it has uh, been used quite a bit, especially for you flannel sewers, wow, you all can make like a whole quilt out of the dust and um, pieces that are under your throat plate. Uh, flannel quilts are fantastic and amazing, but they do leave a lot in the throat plate area. So make sure that if you were making anything flannel in the last couple of weeks that you have cleaned out uh, under your throat plate. We do a lot of flannel in here and uh, they definitely can leave a lot of debris. Okay. All right, last, last set and then we will press these all open. Have these great little little blocks. I thought the instructions were very well written um, for this project. That's why I chose it. There's nothing worse than crappy directions. This one, I, anything with visual pictures, I think, is always the best. So we have our lobe, and at this point, we're going to press. And again, in it's always this whole oh, the rules say this and this. If you want to, I'm going to hit with this with a little best press, okay? If you want to take and you want to press this seam open at this point, you can, okay? So all you would have to do is just finger press that down, bring your iron in. Notice I'm not going back and forth, all right? And I'm showing you both methods because it is a matter of preference. Okay, pressing that down. Good so far. So now we have the seams pressed open, all right, and then I'm going to flip this back over. And you know what? I forgot to do something. Shame on me. Okay. Actually, what I should have done first was set that seam. So we are going to set that seam just like you sewed it. We're going to set that seam. Very, very important. I can't believe I forgot, but I'm human. All right. Hit that with a little bit, and now for those of you that want to press towards, now you could press towards the dark in this step. So you would fold that down, press towards the dark. Again, press towards the dark. Great, and we're just gonna make that go like that. Okay, so now we press towards the dark. I'm gonna hit this on this side one more time. All right, so we have this part done. So that lobe is done, and now we're gonna go through, and again, like I said, it's uh, the whole thing is kind of like doing factory work. You do sets at a time, and then that way, um, you're not starting and stopping. Especially when you're reading directions, it's like, let's do all this once, and then all next. Okay. And we're just going to take our time and press everything. Great. Good so far. Right. Get our lobes done. Like that. Now, some of you uh, use that you do use the best press. You're well aware, I'm sure, that it comes in different scents. Um, I have found the most popular scent. Uh, it tends to be the scentless, the one that doesn't smell like everything. Um, however, if you like yours to have some type of scent, they do come in different scents, like lavender and orange and roses and all that. So it's kind of nice when you're spraying and you have this nice aroma. All right. Any questions so far? Okay, we're good so far. Looks like you guys are following along pretty well. You don't see anybody going, wait, 
stop the presses. So we'll just keep plugging along here. Again, setting those seams, shrinking that thread, getting that all in place. You will notice a marked difference in your seams when you have uh, set that seam, set that thread down. It's a must a must. Oh, so let's talk about irons again, uh, because I got onto this whole thing about irons and how, uh, you know, you should put distilled water in them. Some people uh, have the Olicios. Those are fantastic because they won't burn down your house because they, you set them down and they lift themselves up. That's pretty nifty. I think that's pretty cool. I'm going to use my storage here. Um, some people are using whatever they can find at their local big box retailer. I think that's fine too. Some people like the Rowentas. Um, all irons are all good except for the fact that if you don't treat them correctly they're going to spit and sputter. So important thing there. Oh and let's talk about why I'm using my storks here and not a pair of eight inch blades. So when I'm next to the sewing machine uh, and I have to clip a string or I have to clip a bobbin thread or whatever it is to me much safer to have a very tiny blade cutting s s strings uh, off of something than an 8 inch blade that I could easily drop onto the floor. Remember I mentioned earlier about making sure that you have shoes on. Many people sew in their bare feet and they drop those 8 inch blades not to say that this coming down at you know, 30 miles an hour onto your foot isn't going to like do something. However, um, these are lightweight, easy to handle, and good for getting up close underneath that sewing machine. So I like storks next to my machine. Uh, and again, I'm not making massive cuts here. It's not like I'm cutting apart huge pieces of fabric. I'm cutting strings. So that's why I like having storks nearby. They And they can tuck right into my storage box there. Okay, so we have that, good press, all right, lobes are looking lobey, and do this one, this one, so I want to open the seam up one, so pressing along here, and then we're going to press that in. So flat is better. For seams. We always want seams to be nice and flat. Alright. And again, I'm on that little pressing mat, getting that good backdraft of heat up through my fabric. So nice and stiff. Okay, so at this point, okay, now I'm gonna have to go over here to the instructions because we want to make sure that we're doing everything she says. Okay, so now we're gonna add, uh, if you're following along, we're on instruction number. Um, six. So we're going to do our rectangles at this point and I'm going to give you guys a second to catch up. So let's talk about some of the things that we've shown so far. So we showed our mechanical uh, pencil that uh, is ceramic lead, nice and smooth when you're drawing, especially if you're in dark fabric. Um, that one is uh, $13.99 and you would comment so mark. So that one is the white and then we also have it in the yellow because the biggest problem most people have when marking is you're not on a lot of white fabrics a lot of the time. You're on darker fabrics like purples and blacks and blues and it's very hard to see those lines being drawn. So if you are interested in the yellow one, you're going to comment so draw. Again, and it comes with the lead refill, which is ceramic. It's not really lead. Um, the wool pressing mat that I'm on is uh, from Gypsy Quilter. They, I have not seen one of these burned yet ever. Uh, I have seen a lot of the off brands that burn um, because people have pressed and pressed and for some reason their wool pressing mats are getting browner and browner and browner. These Gypsy Quilters you can rinse, uh, especially like, like we've been starching on here. We can rinse this off in cool water, hang it up to dry, and it's ready to go again. So that is care for the wool mat. 
Um, they I have it in two sizes. I have a 13 and a half and 13 half. So if you're interested in one for sitting next to your uh, sewing machine, it's called Press, P-R-E-S-S. That's $35.99. It's the 13 and a half inch size. And then for those of you that want to stick one over on your ironing board, we do have it in the 17 and a half by 24, which is larger, which is the one actually my machine's on right now. And you would come at sold large. We'll go over these at the end. I just want to show a couple things to you. And then our uh, holder for all our little materials right now. This is our stash and store. And it comes in mint, pink, aqua, and white. They're $11.99. They're really cool because it's a silicone. And if you want to have one of those, you would comment sold. Hold. And then you choose mint, pink, aqua, or white. Okay, so I just wanted to give that. Give you guys a chance to catch up. All right. Oh, and the uh, <laughs> the little storks. If you're interested in having a pair of storks next to your sewing machine, you would comment sold bird. And they're $4.99. They're really sweet. Okay, is there a difference between regular spray starch and best press? Yes. So, um... I, okay, so there's actually a difference between starch sizing and, and best press. And I don't know what the secret ingredient is in the best press. There's lots of speculation over the years that it's a vodka and something. I don't know. I'm not going to taste it to find out. However, the best press um, does not leave any type of residue on the material. So if you're using spray starch, a lot of times when you, if it's still wet and you hit it with that iron, you, what you find is that there's all these little flakes all of a sudden now on on your uh, fabric and it's sticky. So this doesn't leave any type of sticky anything and no flakes. Um, you'll get that with starch and you'll get that with sizing. Uh, and then uh, the other thing is, is it's just not, I mean it makes it stiff. Uh, starch is the stiffest. If you're looking for like board then, you know, sewing on a board, yeah, sure, uh, starch, I would still water it down. However, uh, the best press to me, it takes care of all those issues and um, isn't sticky and doesn't leave any flakes. So that's my, my two cents on that. Okay, so let's keep going here. So we have our, our uh, lobes and now we're going to sew them onto our rectangular so we are on step six in the instructions at this point I am going to hit these with some best press because I don't have I did not do that yesterday and I should have uh, but I just did so we're going to hit these and make sure that they're nice and stiff and again I'm not going back and forth I'm just pressing 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 and the uh, Biggest problem I see in class is a lot of times people are just, they're just hammering the heck out of their fabric with that iron. And it doesn't, the small pieces, they stretch really fast. So don't do that. Make sure that you're, you're pressing, okay? Pressing, pressing. If you have a travel iron, that's great too. I've seen a lot of people use them. I don't have any opinions on that. I don't mean to have so many opinions anyway, it's just things I pop into my head that people ask me um, when I'm teaching. So I kind of like just want to put that out there. You can always add your comments on things. If you use Best Press and you love it, tell me you love it. I, I'd like to know. If you are a starch user and have been for decades, let me know. I think that's great. Um, again, a lot of things in quilting is personal preference. There are some hard and fast rules. Quarter inch seam allowance, that's a must. Uh, pressing the fabric, that's a must. Uh, having good needles, that's a must. You know, not using the same needle for 30 projects, don't do that. <laughs> it's just, you're not, you're not, go and you know how you know your needle's dull? You can hear like this thudding sound when you're sewing. That is a definite indication that your needle is dull or it's skipping stitches or whatever. So make sure that you change that needle out. Okay. So at this point, I'm putting right sides together. Okay. So for those of you that are new uh, to quilting, that means I've taken this here and put it against the, the right side here. That's the side with the dark color. All right. And we're going to sew that together. All right. So quarter inch seam allowance again. Ready to go.
notice I, I am pulling pins as I'm going. These pins are a little thick, but they're magnetic, so, um, you know, they can't be perfect. It's just one of those things. Okay, so, unit is sold. Now we're going to do the next unit, because we have to do two lobes. Make sure that you are sewing it this way. All right, just like in the instructions. So I, for those that are visual, like myself, who almost sewed that wrong, going this side here, and I'll line that up. Okay. And ha, huh, here's another good thing that people wonder about. Should you be sewing with it like this or like this? In log cabin quilt class, I learn from Penny, the lady that does the amazing log cabin uh, things for Creative Grids. She sews with the seams down. Uh, she gives a lengthy explanation in her book as to why I find that not having the seams flip up uh, tends to come out this way by sewing a solid piece on top. So notice that none of my seams flipped up. Okay, so. So if you have one way that you like, cool. But I'm going to definitely sew these with uh, the solid piece on top. All right, so sew it along here. Put a couple pins in place to hold. I forgot to turn that alarm off on this Elna. Elna has a built-in alarm for the bobbin thread to let you know that it's nearing the end. However, this is a full bobbin, so the fact that it is alarming, it is quite alarming, is kind of annoying, so I will turn that off, but we're not going to do it right now because I have the needle set just where I want it. All right, how's everybody doing? You can put a pot holder under your pressing mat that will help under your surface. If you start after spraying your fabric, rub your fabric to pop the starch bubbles will help with flaking. Thank you, Carol. For the uh, information on starching because anything that will help other people be successful is always a good thing I appreciate that yeah and Carol I do have a cardboard mat under my uh, wool pressing mat today because I don't want to um, make my cutting mat warp and for those of you that uh, have found out the hard way, anything that's below your wool pressing mat, if it's not, if it's plastic, it's going to warp unless you protect that. So, and warped cutting mats are pretty much goners. I have not successfully been able to restore a warped cutting mat um, back to life from an incident with the iron. We won't talk about that incident. It was not cool. However, uh, definitely protect your surface behind your wool mat. That is always good advice. Okay. My apologies for my arms in the way. I just am leaning across the table. So when you're sewing, let's talk about ergonomics for a second. Uh, your shoulders should uh, be pushed downwards. You shouldn't be hunching. If you cannot see, please get yourself better lights. LED lights are very, very nice. How do I sit next to the machine? Because if you're slouching and trying to peer in because you cannot see, you're going to end up with sore shoulders uh, when you're done, and that is never fun. And also make sure, like I said earlier, that your feet are flat on the floor. You don't want them tucked up under you. Uh, that is not good for posturing. And um, if we all right, something just popped in my head. If you go back to the 1950s, it says to have your lipstick on in case your husband comes home in the middle of your sewing because you always want to be presentable to your husband. Um, so it did actually say in the Singer Sewing Book to put your lipstick on and do your hair if you're going to be sewing because guests might pop in at any moment and you always want to be put together. Just a little side note, I think. I think that's kind of funny. If you're sewing in your pajamas today, I think that's fine too. However, uh, make sure that your shoulders are down, your feet are flat on the floor, you're not slouching, you're not hunched over, you're not trying to um, climb up underneath that sewing machine so you can see. Your lighting should be good. Uh, if you wear glasses, make sure you have them. And uh, that way you are comfortable. 
There's nothing worse than hands going numb from shoulder strain and all those kinds of things. So, okay, make sure that you're ergonomically sitting properly. I'm gonna just step over here for just a second. Okay, so hopefully you guys are sewing right along the same spot I'm at. I'm gonna pull those pins. All right. And we're going to open this up. Well, no, we're going to set that seam. Yep, setting seams. Important, important. They're already pretty well stiff. I'm not going to starch that at that point. And I do apologize. I have been sick. So if you're hearing me nasally talking to you, it's not how I normally sound. We will be live Friday night at 7 p.m. So if you, uh, we were not on last Friday because I was sick and however, we will be on this Friday at 7 PM. And I did put up the link for that today in the events section and I will send out an email so that you, uh, can join us. We do have new fabrics this week. Uh, the Kim deal grace and gratitude fabric has arrived. So we'll be definitely going into that. The simple whatnots club and all those fun things and things that have come back in stock okay pressing 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 see that shifted on me there's nothing worse than that okay so we'll deal with that later all right now we're going to open this up and press towards the dark notice how i did all of them again we're working in units so all of them got pressed to set their seams in one unit. Same thing here. We're going to press that towards the dark. Mini quilting is uh, where you're doing very small blocks uh, and your finished maybe product is like a 12. A lot of times we'll open up seams for in those instances. But if you're doing like ginormous lap quilts and stuff with like one or two seams, this should all be good. Okay. Press that. Try not to burn your fingers. Right. When do you use best press? Okay, so I'm doing everything basically off of feel right now. I can feel that my two pieces of fabric are very stiff. If I was, um, if I had not starched this yet already, or if I, <laughs> or if I have pressed a seam incorrectly, I will hit that with the best press, reset that seam, okay, like this, and then set the seam the way it's supposed to be. Maybe I pressed the wrong direction and I need to reset. That is a time I will hit that with best press. For right now, it is uh, at a point where my fabrics are stiff. Okay, I'm not. Um, some people best press every single seam, and I think that's fine too. We'll, we can do that. Um, but, like I said, it's a lot of times. It's a. It's. It's a almost a as you're going along. If you feel like it's just not stiff enough, that best press will really help set that, and you're gonna get a nice flat seam. Okay, good question. Thank you for asking. Okay. Yeah, there's times where you're like, oh, I think I'm going to press it this way. And then, because I know the rule is, is always press towards the dark, always press dark. That's fine, except for in instances where you cannot press towards the dark because you're going to end up making all your seams wonky. And um, that is then, that out goes the window. It has to be pressed because your goal is always what's flat, whatever is flattest. Right now we're still in good shape, but if I had no other choice, see how nice and flat that is, if I had no other choice to pull that seam this way because I had other seams coming up this way, then that is what has to happen at that point. So we want to always make sure that um, we're, we're pressing in the direction that makes the most sense, ideally towards the dark as your first, but it doesn't happen like that every single time. Okay, now watch this. Fun. How cool is that? 
magnetic pin bowls. Cool. All right, so we have our lobes all done. Now we're going to get to the part of our of our story here where we do our nine patches. So I'm going to set these off to the side. All right, we're there. We're going to set them off to the side. And uh, at this point, we have our little two-inch squares, and we're going to talk about strip uh, piecing again, just like we did earlier, chain piecing. So I have um, set mine into little units of nine. I've gone through yesterday and um, kind of pre-organized again because of time. So I'm going to pull out my little my little squares. All right, and I'm going to push you guys back this way. So we have our little squares and um, chain piecing. I'm going to just put two squares together. Now, if you want to lay yours out ahead of time and you want to visually see what your nine patch is going to look like, then I encourage you to do so. Um, if you are not concerned and you just want your little nine patch to uh, kind of take its own personality, you can do that too. So at this point, I'm going to sew strips together. Now, this is not a project where we're strip piecing off of uh, three fabrics that I've put together in a long strip and then subcut. That's not how this project goes. That's that option. But this is just how um, our instructions are written for our project today. So we're going to go ahead and, you know what, that one is not, nothing worse than finding a square that's not cut right. So I'll have to go into my bag. I have a backup baggie of squares. So at this point, I'm going to start piecing my, or chaining my pieces together. All right. These were uh, starched, so they're stiff already. Okay. And this is like the cool part about quilting where you can just kind of put your little pieces together, start right in. Did I do that wrong? I did. Well, we're just going <laughs> to... That's kind of funny. Where's my little storks? I've lost my storks. Talking about storks. Oh, they're in the holder. Right where they should be. Alright. So... Alright. This is how... Don't get chain piece crazy. That's what I meant to say. Because... Okay, this is going to be how my block is going to end up looking, but if I had kept going and sewn this to this, then I wouldn't be able to put, if I had sewn this to this, I wouldn't be able to put the ends on these rows. So only throw, sew three sets and then you're going to add in your last, your last one. Okay, don't get all crazy and just chain piece and then you're going to end up having to cut them apart. And then that's never, unsewing is never as much fun as sewing. So, all right. So we have our, our thing here, cut this guy here, and I have to get into my bag because I have a I have a square that I also cut these on on the go. Um, and I layer when I cut on my go. So when I was layering out, I must have skipped a a block. So we'll just go into our bag here and grab. Square. All right. Now we're good there. So I did notice that I have to get a new mat for my my go. It has worn its course and no longer helping my dies stay straight. Okay. So we have all these, right? Good there so far. All right. Now here's where I'm going to set these off to the side because we have to do this four times, but I want to talk to you in just a minute about pressing in certain directions so we have nesting seams. So I'm going to set this one off to the side, and now I'm going to do this one. Again, don't get uh, don't get all crazy with your chain piecing, because you need to set aside a couple for the end of those, those little units. And sewing is never as much fun necessary, but it's one of those things. This one. 
hopefully you guys have uh, a little selection of pinks and reds and hearts. This year off, uh, there was only a couple of lines that came out with hearts. Um, sometimes they're very muted looking, the lines, there's a lot of gray in them, and I tend not to order gray hearts or gray out looking lines. It just, it's Valentine's Day to me, it's the middle of winter. I want things to be as bright and cheerful as possible, it's probably because of where I live. It's overcast here most of the year, so color is like essential. Bright colors. Uh, so hopefully you have a nice selection in your stash for today's table topper. Hopefully. Okay. There we go. This set sewn. This is the tedious part of the sewing project. The the nine patches. So. Uh, some of, some quilting can be tedious, uh, but again, it's fun. It's necessary to do the little steps. Of course, the reward is always at the end when you get to put everything together and see how beautiful everything turns out. That's always the fun part. That's why we quilt. And maybe you've already thought of if you're going to keep this for yourself. I know quilters tend to be a generous lot and uh, gift many, many of their projects uh, to friends and family. So maybe you are already thinking of who you'd like to share today's project with and as a giveaway. Maybe you're keeping it for yourself. Maybe you've bought yourself a really nice candle and you're going, you know, the perfect place in your house that you're going to put this. I mean, it's a 22 inch square, so it's not tiny, but it's It'll, it'll look nice standing out for Valentine's Day. Maybe you've already figured out what you're doing or where it's going. Maybe you haven't yet. Maybe you're still going to find a place in your house for it. The important part of this is that we finish. Um, if you're going to come this far, you might as well take it all the way to the end and finish it up. It's not that big of a project. I know many of us have our UFOs. I have mine. Um, but seasons dictate that we get our Valentine's projects done in January so that we have them for February. That's just how that goes. Kind of like our St. Patrick's Day projects. Again, uh, we do them in February so we have them ready to go for March. It's not our fault. It's just seasonal sewing. Kind of like it gets to September and we need to really, really start in on our Christmas projects or our uh, projects for whatever you're sewing for. Maybe you sew for Hanukkah or maybe you sew for uh, Kwanzaa? I don't know. Whatever you're sewing for. Just sometimes the months hit and you have to stop working on your regular projects and take care of that seasonal sewing. So, so. Some of you need to start in July for your Christmas sewing because you have that many people you make this for. All right. So here we are. We're going to end up with our last little bit, our nine patches almost done. Is it much nicer sewing with other people when you have to do tedious things like nine patches? I find that sewing with a group tends to make this go a lot faster process. That way you're not, especially, you know, you get those those, pro those quilt projects where it's like, oh, cut 758 two inch squares and then make 50 sets of 12 patches or whatever. And you're like, oh, good grief, I need a good movie. So, the ADD kicks in. All right, so at this point, let's get back to our nine patch. And this is important. We're going to press in certain directions um, so that our seams will nest. And for those of you that are new, I will give you a visual of what I exactly mean and I'm talking about at this point in, in our venue, okay? So 
we're going to go through and sell all our seams and then I'm going to show you how we're going to sew these into rows. So again, we're going to make sure that we are hitting this with set most seams. Okay. We'll do that. And you notice I sewed all the all the nine patch blocks got sewn at the same time because again, if I start skipping around, I'm going to miss a set of instructions. And then at that point, I could be making mistakes. Mistakes are fine, but we try not to make them. All right, at this point now, I'm going to lay this back out and I'm going to think which one of these do I want in the middle? I kind of want that darker square in the middle. That's just me for this one. So what I'm going to do is the top, this is going to be my top, all right? And I'm going to press those seams away from the center. So I'm going to hit this with some starch because I'm feeling like it's just not um, stiff enough. Okay, so those seams are going away from the center and I will bring this up closer so that you can see what I'm talking about. Notice that these seams here, they're going away from the center, all right? And you press towards the dark, I'm not worried about that right now. This set of seams, which is the middle one, I'm going to press in towards the center. All right, so I hit that with my best press. It's always funny to watch fabric move when it's kind of when you hit it with something where it's kind of like it comes alive. So these seams are going to go inny. Okay, they're in towards the center. So pressed in. Okay. I'm going to lay them right back, right there. There's a reason I'm doing this. And then the bottom row is going to go out just like the top row. Those of you that have been quilting for a while understand exactly what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. But the point is to show, show those that are new why we're doing it. All right. So those are all pressed. I'm going to make sure I flip this over. Remember I was talking a minute ago about how sometimes the rules go out the window about pressing towards the dark and all that. This is one of those times the rules are going out the window because we want to make sure that this lines up just right. So at this point, I'm going to flip this down. And when I do, the seam from the top is heading that way. The seam from the center is heading this way. And what that forms is this little locking section. All right, I'm going to try and come up real close here where when I push that together, I'm going to push those two seams right up against each other and they naturally butt into place and they hold. Now, because I'm me, I like to add a little pin there. Okay, just because, just for, for getting it under the machine. And then this one is also going to butt right up against and they lock, they lock each other together. All right, does that make sense? Hopefully that made sense to you. And then I'm going to take it to the machine and I'm going to sew that in that locks those seams and makes those points perfect. And that becomes really clear when um, you're sewing things that you have points coming together. Now, I don't have like a triangle coming together right now, but notice how perfect those, those intersections are. That is because I lock those seams. So I have to remember this is my center. So I'm going to take my, my bottom here and I'm going to flip that up. And again, I'm going to lock, lock those seams right into place. And that's because I pressed those, that, those sections separate and thought about it before I did it. Okay. So we're going to lock that down. Lock, make sure that the other one is locked as well. Okay. Now, if yours is still a little wonky, ah, that seam walked up on me. If yours is still a little wonky, it could be a number of reasons. It could be that um, you didn't press them the directions and you might have flubbed that section. That, that's a possibility. Okay. Again, so here we have our, our nine patch perfect little nine patch. All right. Uh, it could be that you st stretched your fabric out of place somehow and um, they just aren't locking at that point. Now, 
I am going to press this because I'm going to get to the others in just a second. See how this is like way sticking up? Okay, it is going to be way sticking up because I'm going to have to press that down. At this point, I find that if I add a little bit of spray starch, it relaxes that seam. I'm going to set it. Okay, I'm going to set that in place. Set this one in place. Okay. We're going to lock that all down. Now, earlier I was talking about a lot of seams and a lot of intersections. You can, if you want to, press these out, okay, away from each other and make that nice and flat. You can do that, and that's fine. Or, if you want, you can take and open these seams up and press them nice and flat. This is a optional part of your quilting. You get to decide that. Um, I'm not going to talk about the cutting out the little thing and flipping and making a little circle. That's for a whole different class. We're not doing that today. I'm opening my seams. Again, I think a part of this just comes into who you've been taught by and your experience. So if you um, are a lay it to the side and press it down kind of, kind of quilter, that, that's fine. I've been taught a little differently. It just kind of, my experience is, I like to open at this point because I like everything really, really flat. So, okay. So now we have a flat nine patch. And I'm gonna set this off to the side. Okay. So now that we have all, all them together, again, I'm gonna to lay this out so I can visually see what I want to be in my center. And I'm going to put the little flowers in my center this time. And um, I want to hit these with, set these little seams, setting seams, fun, fun. All right. And I'm going to, again, press the top one so it goes out away from the center. So I'm going to do that. start so his seams are going outward okay and then this guy I know he needs some starch he's just not he's not being happy with me hit that now we're gonna do this one what a fun little project for for Valentine super simple you get it done in an afternoon not a three-day project well unless you have to like do other things it could turn into a three-day project my apologies if it does um because we always want to try and get our stuff done i don't know about you but i'm more of a try and get it done in a couple of days so like for a large project rather than a month i don't like month-long projects because other things tend to pull me away from that project hence the ufos that we all end up this one, like I said, is nice because it's like an afternoon. Okay, so we have him going out, him going in, him going out. We're going to flip these down. I'm going to lock those seams one more time. Okay, nice locking seams. I'm going to put my pin there to hold it. All right. And off we go. Now, Full disclosure, you are not watching the world's perfect quilter. I have a friend that is the world's perfect quilter. Maybe you have a friend that the world is the world's perfect quilter. Um, and I think it's cool to have those friends. I, however, am not the world's perfect quilter. I do my best. I try my best. And sometimes that's all we can do. <laughs> There's some of us that have lots of talent and gifts. Um, in their quilting. A lot of it is learned. A lot of it is absolute rules. And then there's just some people that have a natural ta talent knack, whatever you want to call it, for everything just being perfect. And I think it's great that those people exist because it gives us all something to strive for. But I am also very much a realist about my abilities. And, uh, 
know that the blue ribbon at quilting competitions is not my future and I'm okay with that. So it might be something that you guys have done and I'm really, really proud of you if you've managed to get your, your blue ribbon for uh, entering. A lot of people enter quilts uh, in their local fairs uh, and I you know, love going to fairs and seeing the talent or the quilt shows. Uh, Western Pennsylvania has a mm, abundance of talented quilters, extremely talented quilters. We, ha we have them. It's not in the water. Um, before you think it's in the water, it's not in the water because I drink the same water. My stuff is not getting blue ribbons at shows. Uh, however, uh, again, some people have a very natural talent. But even if you are new and you are stuff is not blue ribbon quality. It might be some days, it, it might not. But that's okay. The point is we're having fun. All right, second block done. On to the third. Okay, moving right along. Doing okay on our time. We're not doing great on our time, but that's okay. We're gonna just keep plugging along here. Uh, okay, I think I'm going to leave the plaid in the center this time. And maybe, um, Here's another thing too, I have found with a lot of classes I've taught, some of my quilters have uh, the need and the desire to make their um, all their blocks the same. They are very uh, straight lines must be always straight kind of people. A lot of quilters are like that. And they need to have that sense that their um, everything is uniform, symmetrical, tailored. Uh, I don't know other other words to explain it to you. So if you are that person, great. That that's just fine too. Um, we are not judging. Your your stuff always looks amazing and perfect. I'm sure that um, the symmetrical thing is, is really cool. Those of us that don't need the symmetrical in this application. Don't mind all the blocks being different, okay? So don't think that um, you are weird because your stuff is not looking like everybody else's in the room. If we all had stuff that looked the same, the world would be boring place. Okay. So I'm gonna put that in. I did custom draperies for interior designers for 10 years. I get the tailored thing. Totally understand the symmetrical thing. Um, because when you make custom window treatments, if you have a fabric that's a twall and there's a little sheep standing in a field with a shepherd, because they make twall fabric like that, Every drape in that room better have that sheep in the exact same spot, otherwise it's not custom. So if you have eight panels and the little sheep is four inches off the floor, he has to be four inches off the floor in every single panel. That's custom work. I did that for 10 years, loved it. Um, the economy, uh, tanked in 2007 and uh, that custom work uh, dried up. A lot of interior designers lost their jobs and uh, a lot of people lost their homes. So that's actually how we ended up making the transition over to Women in a Quilt Shop because we started teaching lessons and People were asking a lot for quilting lessons, so we ended up opening a storefront as a direct relation to that changing market. The market drying up, and then interior designers, hey, another block, hopefully you're doing just fine. So. So if you ever are in a position where you order custom window treatments, now you know that 
your fabrics all have to be identical going around the room, otherwise they're not custom. All right, so I have this laid out again. I know which one I want. My big polka dot in the center there. So we're gonna set these seams. Setting our little seams. And then we're going to press that out. Apologize for the sleeves. These are out. I know that these guys are going to be hit with some starch because the fabric is just kind of doing its own thing right now. This is getting exciting. Hope you're getting excited because we're getting ready to really start putting this together and making it look like something after this part. So this is where all our tedious bits and pieces are going to start coming together. Make it look like a table topper. One more time. You go out. Try not to stretch anything. That's really, really important. The nice thing about the wool mat though too is um, everything kind of locks. It's not like, it's like a, I'm pushing against it, but it's not like walking across the table. So that was something that I just said that. So one of the things about the wool mats that are, that are pretty cool. All right, so again, we have our outs going to our ins, locking those seams into place. Nice thing about doing a project in January is we don't have the distractions of the springtime or summertime calling us away from our sewing machines where we might have a garden that needs tending today or we might have a picnic that we're obligated to go to. We get to actually just kind of relax and enjoy the fact that we're allowed to be stuck inside. Unless you live in a climate, some of you might live in like Florida, where uh, I pressed that seam wrong, see? Where you do get to go outside and enjoy your your climate and everything, but uh, I'm on the wrong way talking. Anyway, we don't have the distractions, I guess. Unless you're at work right now and you're supposed to be working. But some people have very boring jobs. And this is a nice distraction. Not to say that you're not doing your job, it's just you have a job that maybe doesn't need your full attention right now. However, if you're working at the drive through or someplace that you have customers in front of you, you should be tending to them. <laughs> Don't ignore them right now. <laughs> my son works at the drive-thru, so that's why the drive-thru came to my head. My youngest son, I should say. All right, so press that. Oh, it's at that seam. See how easy it is to forget certain things. They make all the difference. So this is why we don't want to rush through our projects. We're going to take our time. And there we go. Pressing that open. And again, I'm pressing open. You might choose to not press open. That's perfectly your prerogative. I'm pressing open. Again, it's it a lot of it is just where I come from in training, you know, who's trained me. All right. Okay. So nine patch block. Yay. Awesome. All right. Let's check our instructions. Make sure that we are exactly where we're supposed to be. Because I believe we're going to get to that really exciting part. And I want to make sure that you are right along with me here. Oh, the mouse shut off. That's not fun. All right. So we have now completed step number eight, and it says in our instructions that each of our patches should measure five by five. So let's do a quick check. I have my, let me set this off to the side here. 
Okay, let me push you back so that you guys can see. All right. So five by five, and I have my mini stripology ruler here. If you aren't familiar with this, this is like the world's best mini um, measuring de device for our for like pre-cuts. If you do a lot of like five inch charm packs, two and a half inch things, ten inch squares, all those kinds of things, then um, this is a great tool because it has these slots in it. So if I have to trim something, I just take my rotary and uh, I can take my rotary and slide it right inside of these slots and get a perfect cut. So this is the mini stripology ruler. And it looks like I'm pretty dead on for that one. So one of the things I, I reasons I chose this pattern today is because she gave measurements in what completed blocks should look like as you got them done. And it drives me bonkers when I'm supposed to, I'm at a point of process and I don't know how big my finished block should be. Yes, I should be able to do the math. However, I can be quite lazy and I don't want to sit and calculate the math. So right now we should have five inch squares. This My, my little stripology ruler is showing me that my squares are five inches. So I'm really, really pleased. Um, because that means that everything is going well. So at this point, I can go ahead over to our next set of instructions, and we're going to be on step eight. And before we get to um, attaching our lobe to our uh, nine, in, nine, nine patch, we're going to take and attach this portion to our previous portion. Uh, which I have set over here off to the side. Lost the woods. Just try not to dump the camera while I'm talking to you. Oh, there's that I want to tell you about in a second. Okay. They were trying to run away. They're back. All right. So we have our lobe, and now I have to attach the lobe to my uh, three and a half inch square that I had cut in my previous section. So we're going to uh, do this several times. And um, so I'm choosing one of each. Okay, so I have my lobes. Let me try and back you up for just a second. I have my lobes. I'm going to take one and set it off to the side from each section. Okay, because right now I need only one of each colorway that I did for this part. So I'm setting, I have two of each color and I'm setting one off to the side and I'm going to use one for this part. All right. And I have my nine inch patches. I'm going to set them over here because they're going to go together in just a second with that. Okay. And then, so what I'm going to do is I have my square and I'm going to sew this to this just like in the instructions. All right. So, uh, and you know what? I did not hit these yesterday when I got them around. I also cut these on the go for those that have a go and are wondering, this is your three and a half inch square. I have that six inch cube thing. Uh, I bought it from a friend of mine. And in that cube set are the different uh, cuts. Okay, so point here is that this has to be matched up. All right, so we're gonna match up this, and um, and I'm not like saying you need to go out and get an AccuQuilt Go cube and all. Do I am not saying that. Do not come back and go. Kimberly said that in order for me to successfully quilt, I need to have one of these. No, that is not what I'm saying. However, for those of you that do have one, they are nice, um, and you can use that to help you cut out things. I'm finding um, from the years spent uh, sewing, quilting, teaching, uh, drapery work is very hard on the hands and uh, the hands are not what they used to be. So the cutting um, with the goes has helped significantly um, reduce strain on my hands. So now if you want a go, and you need an excuse. 
I'm not saying to lie because you should never lie. However, if you do honestly have hand issues and are finding that you could benefit maybe from not having to rotary cut so much with your hands, then maybe a go is in your future. I am not a go salesman. I do not work for the company. Full disclosure. All right, so we're going to put all those together. How exciting. This is getting really exciting. We're getting there. Okay. All right, and i got to click back over to make sure that I've not lost you guys on my feet here. Oh, you're still with me? Awesome. Okay. And now we're going over to, let's see, we are now at the point where we're going to sew the other lobe so we're on step nine still. We're going to sew the other lobe to the... Okay, somehow the machine has like taken and decided to like walk on its own here. So now we're going to take our, our squares and we're going to sew our lobe to the edge of the square. Okay, so this is our next step. Again, I'm sewing all these units. I'm going to press in just a minute. So that's what we're... They're going to do it. Now, I don't, I'm not going to sit here and um, measure, ma match up color to color. If you're doing that, that's fine. I'm going to grab a pin from my amazing magnetic pin bowl. Um, if you want to match up the colors, great. You can do that. It's yours. You get to, again, if you did this in blue today, it, that's on you. That is perfectly fine with me. If you like blue hearts, we are not judging. Okay, I can strip piece this section, so I'm just going to leave that on the machine, and I'm going to put in the next, the next unit. Okay. It's nice and flat, which is great. Again, I just kind of lift up the back of that presser foot just a hair uh, to get these to go under. The machine. I'm not using a foot pedal. I have a start and stop on this machine. I have it set to slow. If you are, are new to quilting or sewing, fast is not your friend. Um, fast typically means that it's not accurate. And if you're new, if you've been sewing for 60 years and fast is your speed, I have friends that sew fast, they're accurate, great. I'm not judging. I'm just saying. Go slow if you're starting out. Okay. Put this down. All right. Hopefully you're at the point where I'm at where you're able to put your your lobes on. If you're not, don't worry. This is being recorded, so even if you have to stop because you have to go tend to children or make supper or something. No, not on the West Coast. You guys are probably just finishing lunch, but. It's okay. We're not rushing. All right, so we have our unit. Now we're going to press. Again, we're going to set that seam. Okay, setting seam, setting seam. All right, and we're going to set the seam on this one. I tend to work I like working in units. I have neck and back, back issues and invested in a go when I retired since I decided to take a pull and I enjoy the time it saves in cutting. Sandra, I completely agree with you. It, it is, you know, they always say, oh, you know, our ancestors quilted by hand in, you know, their log cabins with their kerosene lamps. I'm telling you now, if those women had sewing machines like we have, they would not have been sitting there hand quilting. Um, it's hard on the hands. But the point is, is, if we have tools available to us and we can uh, afford these tools, properly afford them, you know, uh, we're not doing bad things to afford them, then by all means, get the tools you need. Um, quilting is not a, a cheap hobby. There are ways to be cheap, not in the fabric. Do not be cheap. If you're going to be cheap in quilting, don't go cheap in the fabric. You can go cheap in other things, like maybe you can't afford the uh, $30 pair of wolf scissors, but you can afford the $8 Fiskars from a big box store. Then get the $8 Fiskars. That's not where you want to go cheap. But if you are going to need specific things so that you can continue 
your hobby, then at that point it is what it is. So there are areas that you can afford to go cheap on. Um, again, I'm I'm using a, a $10 iron right now. Like I've had the $130 Rowentas. I had them for the drapery business. I get it. I understand it. It's cool. But you know what? My ten iron, $10 iron is doing the exact same thing as a $70 iron. It's it's pressing a seam. It's making heat. It's doing cool things. So, um, you know, I, I think that's great that you have a, have a go, especially if you have issues. All right. Okay, so we're going to set the seam on this one. Let's press these guys open. Nice and flat. Flat is our friend. I'm going to hit that again because it's just... I was lamenting my thread color choice. Because... Seeing pink. I have a white background fabric. Probably should have chose the white thread today. However, let's see what happens. I'm not going to switch thread between each color. So it's an executive decision we are now living with. Just go over it. Okay. All right, so we have that, that, that. Now we're going to lay these back out. And at this point, it is important that we do match our colors up. So I'm going to make sure that I have my pink polka dots going with my pink polka dots. Okay, it's important. And then if you can see, this is what my my block is going to look like. All right, see my hearts? That's what we're there. We're getting there. So at this point, now what I've noticed is that I did not press this seam to lock with this seam. So I'm gonna go hit this with the spray starch and I'm going to press that the other direction. I do want those to lock. I was talking and okay now what I have is my back side my seams are going to lock in right there all right so you want to try for that lock make sure it's locking and I'm going to throw a pin in it because I know me you will move it always moves this is a two pinner. You're getting two pins. Alright, so there we go. Great. take that and I'm going to set it off to the side checking my points my points look great I'm happy with that better to take that time and check while we can and I had to fix this one I had to fix all of them because I pressed them all the wrong way so we're going to go back this way not a big deal it's okay we're not going to get all excited just kind of change the pressing direction but you notice I did hit it with the spray starch it releases that that um, seam so that it can be molded the other way. Okay. I had a good friend that she starched. And boy did she starch. I think that fabric, if you if you could, it would just stand up by itself. I mean it was like alright. And she would she would press it or she would starch it and she would go through and spray an entire pile of fabric starch it, let it sit for like three to five minutes, and then she'd go back with her iron and just like iron the whole thing. And honest to goodness, it was like a board. You could literally like, okay, three points there. You could literally, it was great because that was the way she, but that's how she was taught. So, you know, not judging. It's all good. Boy, her, and her clothes came out really nicely too. Sometimes I think we, uh, we tend to rush. I understand why we rush. We tend to rush. 
and because there's always the next project and it's always exciting and I can't wait to start this project but I really should finish this part I, I understand I talk to myself the same way looks like the GPS is showing up oh what am I oh, what's in the boxes what are they wait let's find out you're at this point and again if you're not not a big deal hopefully you haven't had to do any unsewing today always you know, we want to make sure that we're happily sewing okay another one and again I'm going to do a final press on those and we do have a measurement for them as well so that's great I have a good UPS driver I'm very happy with him he uh, always puts my boxes on my porch for me because I don't leave them out in the rain so kudos to the awesome UPS driver hopefully you have a good delivery person that comes to your house I did have a uh, speaking of ghost I ordered uh, a thing over Christmas time for the shop and uh, I was not in town when it was delivered so my son said hey he says it got delivered this was FedEx I said hey he says it got delivered did you see the boxes now he would he, he's 16 so everybody who's had a 16 year old boy knows that if he was a snake it would have bit him if he had walked past it right so I said hey three big boxes they, they're like 40 pounds a piece are they are they there what what are you talking about this is what I get what are you talking about there's no boxes here and I'm like are you sure because at this point if he would have walked over the boxes to tell me this because he's 16 and uh, he's yeah and I, okay so I said well you're gonna have to go look for them now and uh, my driveway is not very very long but it's not very short so it's like 10 30 at night and uh, I said you're gonna have to go out with a flashlight and go look for those boxes because I've had this happen before my FedEx driver doesn't like to come up my driveway so he leaves stuff randomly along the driveway and that's just kind of it's weird anyway so 20 minutes later my son comes back gets back on and he says found the boxes and I said awesome that's fantastic where were they and he said oh they were down they were down at the road by the mailbox and I said really and he said yeah he says the one was in the snow the other one was sitting across the top of the three mailboxes because it's my neighbors and I we uh, all three of our mailboxes are linked together I said okay so FedEx being FedEx that day uh, laid my my huge box my 40 pound box in the snow and put the other box across the top of three mailboxes thankfully I have honest neighbors and honest people that drive up and down my drive my road and nobody walked off with my uh, my packages now okay, here's the here's the fun part of the story what was what was in those packages you might be wondering Kimberly what was in the packages that they were 40 pounds oh well in those packages was my $1,200 worth of studio cutter for the shop and dies to go with that cutter so that I could cut uh, 10 inch squares two and a half inch strips so those kinds of things so those two boxes had $1,200, $1,000 worth of AccuQuilt in them down by the road for six hours. Yes, we love FedEx. FedEx is fantastic. All right. So, okay, you are doing wonky things. At this point, we should have our little blocks here, and we are right at our time limit, but we're going to keep going because we have a, just a couple more spots to do, and I hate leaving you on the project. So, all right. At this point, we're going to sew in our 2 by 8 rectangles. And our block should be measuring eight by eight at this point. Now I have eight by eight. All right, so I have another ruler I'm going to bring out here. All right, so I'm gonna push this back and I'm going to find eight by eight. 
looks like Rulers are fun. Rulers are good things. We are just about there. Well, that's pretty close. So we're going to measure these up. They should be 8 by 8. If you're off by just a hair, it's okay. Mine's off just a hair. I might kind of give it a little bit more of a press. Eight. And my ruler has a quarter inch thing on the end, so it might look like I'm gapping, but I'm not. It's just my uh, where I'm measuring from. All right, so we have our eight inch squares. Yay, awesome. And at this point, I'm going to lay this out so it looks aesthetically pleasing and so that I can visually see what this looks like before I start putting the strips down. So we're going to lay this out. Make sure the hearts are all going in the directions that we want them to be going. All right, so we're gonna, I know that it's like two levels here, but we got my hearts, we're doing those, those kinds of things. Okay, and I'm uh, not real happy with that pink, so I think I'm going to opposite these lighter pinks and make that so it is uh, balanced. All right, balance is important and uh, now I'm going to take my strips that I have for this step and a strip is going to go here and a strip is going to go here. All right, hopefully you guys can see that. Let me go back over to here. All right, so I have a strip going here and here at the bottom and then there's going to be a strip that goes across the center. However, I need to sew a square to that strip to make that, that part. And since I'm sitting here with that square, I'm going to go ahead and just do that part first. So I'm going to take my square, it's right there, all right? This is going to be the center, and I'm going to pull these back in because the sewing machine is too far away from where I'm sitting now. So I'm going to pull this back in so you guys can kind of see what's going on. All right, and we're going to sew this to this. So the other strip to the other end. So we're just going to make a, a unit here. Very simple unit. Very important unit, but very simple unit. Excuse that little pop in the center. Now, if your squares are not squaring, um, sometimes it could be a matter of pressing. You might have to go back and press something. Um, if you do need to do that in order to block that out so it is a perfect 8 inches, uh, you hit it with the best press, all right, and um, gently get that to, you know, you might have just like a little bit of, of overlap or something, or it just, it's just a hair, all right. A lot of times um, it's just where if you do the fold over method of, of, of pressing, that fold kind of got caught someplace and might not have actually um, caught properly. It might not have, you might have, oh, you might have pressed a, a crease into your fabric. That's what I'm trying to say. However, um, that can be, that can be fixed. It's just, you're going to, you might have to actually take out a seam to fix it because sometimes you don't realize you've done it until you've gotten to that part. But sometimes we end up pressing creases and, and that's okay. So, yeah, that goes like that. Again, very visual. Must look at everything three times before sewing. All right. How exciting. We're getting there. So I'm going to keep going here. All right. And we're going to take that off. And then this guy goes down here. And this guy's going over here. You sit over here. Don't want you in the way yet. All right. And at this point, I am going to hit this. I'm going to set this seam. Right. Like that. And then I'm going to pull him over. Get all my handy dandy pins. 
your back should look flat. I probably didn't stress that enough. Um, your back of your, of your units should look very flat. Things shouldn't be sticking up, being all wonky. So if you are a person that everything is tailored, everything symmetrical and all that kind of stuff, and you're new to quilting, I will tell you that things will seem a little more frustrating for you because unlike other materials, mediums that people work with, um, fabric moves. It moves a lot. And people don't realize how much it moves in just the simplest things, sewing seams, um, you know, just basic piecing, the fabric has to move. So you might end up where things are not lining up correctly. Most of the time, it's either your quarter inch seam allowance is off, or your pressing is off, or you've stretched your fabric. So as a new quilter, you might find that you're a little more frustrated because this is a medium that has a lot of movement, right? It's kind of like painting. Paint, paint kind of goes where it's going to go sometimes. I mean, see, I pressed that crease into there. Totally my fault. Um, so painting, same kind of thing. The paint's going to kind of go on that canvas. Now, you can control most of it, but certain mediums... They just tend to move. My husband had to have this talk to me one time because we were doing a custom job and fabric was going everywhere. And he's like, Kim, it's not a piece of wood. It's going to move. And I'm like, okay, a very good point. He's right. He was absolutely right. But it was very, very frustrating because sometimes fabrics just do not play nicely. Right? How about that? Linen linen shrinks. Um, not that we're doing a lot of linen in quilting class, but linen can stretch quickly. It can shrink quickly. Um, that's what I'm always trying to say. Make sure that you're using good quality fabric because you, you, you know, a lot of people make that whole, well, I'm new to quilting. I don't want to spend any money. Okay. I understand that. Get the cheap scissors then. However, you hit that to set that seam with that iron, you don't know how much shrinkage you might have just found um, by fabric that isn't so hot. It's not not good fabric. And then you're wondering what you did wrong. Well, it might not be you at all. It might be the fabric. It's just not any good. So try not to, to beat yourself up too bad. However, make good buying decisions with, with your fabric purchase. I have taught many a beginning quilting class and... Um, People will mix their big box retail fabric with maybe some quilt shop quality material. And your seams are just sometimes very difficult to get. And maybe you've never encountered that, and I hope you haven't. It's just because it, it, it can be very frustrating to a new quilter to have seams that just are not playing well. And it's, it can bring you to tears. It really can. Um, I have thrown many a quilt block across into the circular bin for disposal from frustrating fabrics. That's okay. Right? Okay, so we're setting those seams. Fantastic. And I am... Oh, I pressed him in. So I have to press these out. Alright. Doing a little backup here. My other one I pressed out and uh, my center I have going in. So we're going to, as I mentioned earlier, press these correctly here. Gonna press these out. Hopefully you're at this point with me. I hope you're getting excited. It's been a couple hours that we've started our project here. Okay, good press from this side. Hopefully you're having success. You're having success. I'd hate to be having you unsuccessful. We gotta redo this one because I pressed it in, and my my center seam is actually going in. So we're gonna have to 
undo you. Back you go. So if you are mixing fabrics um, between Big Box and Quilt Shop, you might see a little bit of variation in your quilting. Um, might be going, what, what's the problem? All fabrics created equally. It's not. It's really not. Um, most of the fabric from your quilt shops are being made in Japan, Korea, uh, some United States, very oh, very limited United States. We have a lot of laws uh, in the United States that prevent us from manufacturing. It has to do with the water and the dyes. Big box coming out of China, and hence you're going to see that's why you have a different thread count because the fabric they start with has less threads than it's called gray goods. Gray goods coming out of uh, those countries have less thread count to start with. So that's why you have variation. So it is not all created equal. Okay, so we're sewing now that center strip to our lock. Ah, that little nested seam. He, he thought he was going to be slick and switch over on me. I caught on to him. All right, and we want to make sure that we get this corner pinned in. Um, if you are doing a long distance like this, let me stop for just a second and explain. If you're doing a long distance uh, and don't don't fool yourself, your fabric is going to move by times you get from one end of that distance to the other. So make sure that you're stopping along the way and putting pins in. I always pin in this corner because um, otherwise I have a walking issue going on. Now, we can talk about walking feet in a whole different class and, and their purpose and their usefulness, but when we're piecing um, and you have any length, like this span that I just did there, you're going to want to pin that in. Because uh, the fabric, again, back to our discussion about movement, the fabric is going to move. Okay. Pressing, pressing, pressing. And now we're at that exciting part in our day. Here we are. The last big seam here. Okay. So again, I'm going to make sure that those those are locked in, all right, making sure we lock in our, our little points, okay. And again, I'm going to line this up to make sure that this edge is locked in. And it'll be amazing how sometimes you might be looking at like an edge that's kind of wavy. It's amazing how these strips that, the white strips that we're putting on now, they're not waving, they were cut properly, but what they're going to end up doing is getting that whole wavy edge to be nice and straight with the help of the pins and having a straight edge. So it's kind of funny how watching the fabric move itself back into, into place. Um, that is why when you are cutting for borders, you are supposed to measure through the center of the quilt and uh, get your measurements that way because the movement of the fabric is so massive on the edges that uh, you can't get an accurate check typically. I'm not saying every time, so I'm not, I'm not going to say this is forever and ever the case. I'm just saying that typically if you just measure your two edges there's so much movement on those edges from the fabric that you're not going to get an accurate border measurement. So that's why we, we measure through the center to figure out borders. So awesome. All right, let's see where we're at here. We'll give it a press. Everything looks like it has stayed in place and you moved. 
sometimes there's always those those seams that just decided to do their own thing. Press this. All right. And I hope that you are at this part of the process with me. If not, you should be pretty close. Or maybe you're just watching. Okay, I know many of you are still watching. Which is great. All right. So here's what we have so far. Let's make sure that you guys can see that. How cool is that? Hopefully yours looks about the same um, or similar. Like I said, maybe yours is like purple and pink. I don't know. Maybe yours is blue and orange. Um, and at this point, we have our, our good points. Everything is nice and straight. Okay. We didn't have any mishaps along the way, so we we're pretty happy campers. And the easy part of the border is right upon us. So we have, it's like 320, so we're going to keep going because it's only like a few more minutes. We're almost done. And, uh, and we're just at that point where we just want to be really, really going to finish up with our project here. So at this point, I'm going to set this over here and I'm going to give you guys just a second to catch up. Let's talk about some cool things. So because you guys are in class today and you were so awesome to stay and, and watch so far, um, the materials I'm showing you, uh, I have, uh, I'm going to give you a coupon code that you guys can use to save at checkout. So if you decide that you want something from class, you're going to get an extra 10% off. And um, that's just my little thank you for, hey, join me for a cool class. You're awesome. Thank you so much. So uh, let's go over a couple of those things. I'm going to give you guys a chance to kind of catch up here for just a minute and uh, give you the code for the coupon, which I wrote down. And yeah, it's fun when things move. So let's go back to what we have here in class a little bit while you guys catch up, because we're going to do those borders and then we're going to be done. And I don't want to lose you in the last couple of minutes. I want to make sure you get your coupon. So uh, the word for the coupon, which looks like I'm going to have to write down again because it, it moved. I'm just getting my other materials here, just because this is our last little section, really quick, easy section. So uh, code for the, I'll write it down because I lost the paper. These things happen when you're live. All right, so here's your coupon code. Your coupon code today is heart, ha, how, how like amazing is that? Right, so there's heart. And again, a couple of uh, things we used in class. These are our storks. And you're going to come and sold bird if you need a pair of storks. Shipping is $5 up to $75. After $75, it's free. We have our Sew Steady, which is this amazing tool. Here, we'll stick our storks in it and our pencil. Okay, silicone cleanup is nice. This is going to be used to hold everything. We have our wool pressing mats. The large 17 by 24 is large. The smaller one, which is 13 half by 13 half, that you can use to sit next to your sewing machine, you're going to call that one press. If you don't have a wool pressing mat, I would highly recommend getting one. They are absolutely amazing. My sew line pencils, the yellow is called draw. The white is comment sold mark. You can get yellow and white if you want one of each. Comes with the refills, which is nice. The mini stripology ruler, which we'll be using in other classes coming up. Um, this is called Strip. Absolutely phenomenal universal rotary cutting tool. Like you really want to have one of these. They're really, especially if you do a lot of pre-cuts. Uh, again, we're using our Schmetz chrome needles. That's a pack of 10 for $10. And you're going to come at sold pack. And our magnetic pin bowl is called Grab. And that comes in black, purple, red, yellow, and teal. And then again, if you are a new quilter and uh, you need, uh, you would just have, uh, we have this handy pocket guide. We showed this at the very beginning, so if you relate, late, uh, again, it's a laminated pocket guide. It talks about cutting, piecing, how to do these set and seams that we talked about today, the importance of pressing. So this is a handy little guide. It's $4.99, and you're going to come at quilt if you want one of those. All right. All right, let's finish up our project. We are we're this close to success. 
And we're going to have this beautiful table topper. And she, uh, in her directions, mentions, I'm going to set him off to the side here. In her directions, she, uh, the writer talks about how to quilt your quilt. All right, I'm going to turn this back this way for you. And um, yes, we have to put our strips on. I had, had, had to think for just a second. We put these strips on because I think our final border is the other strip. Let me check with her. This mouse. So um, if you get to the point where you're going to finish this and you're going to layer it up. Okay, we are down to step number 13. We're going to do our sides. Uh, if you are, you're just going to go to the end and you're going to make sure that you um, finish this. She suggests uh, doing a stitch in the ditch for your quilting. Now, if you are new to quilting and you have no idea what that means, basically stitch in the ditch means that you are going to take your, yeah, I'll see if I can show you real quick. You're going to take and sew right next to that, that seam that you have coming down. You're going to sew the whole way down and you would do this after you layered your sections. So it'd be your top, your batting, and your backing. And then she recommends stitching in the ditch. If you don't want to stitch in the ditch and you want to just free motion quilt that, you can do that. Again, this is your project, so there's no right or wrong. Um, I think the stitch in the ditch will look nice. I'm not sure if I'm going to do mine that way. I haven't decided. Usually I make those decisions um, depending on how much time I have, what I'm doing for the day. Sometimes I'm just a free motion quilt kind of girl. And I'll just throw on my free motion foot and um, just kind of do an all over. That again, it's just kind of my mood. If I'm, if I want that stitch in the ditch look, uh, which is always a very nice look, very traditional looking, I will do that. Um, so if you are unfamiliar with what I'm really talking about right now, don't feel bad, especially if you're new to quilting. You're not supposed to know everything right now, but basically what we're talking about is finishing up our three layers where we've put together the top, the backing, and the batting, okay? Now you might be asking yourself, what kind of batting should I use for, for this? It's a table topper, um, so you really don't need like any high loft, poofy, whatever batting. You can just use... Um, something that's kind of like a poly if you want to. It really is going to kind of depend on what uh, look you want. I am going to use, we sell in the shop um, fusible batting. It's like table runner width. I think, I, I shouldn't say I'm going to because I have to go actually go measure this when we're done. It should work because I think it's 20, I have right next to me. Okay, so I have this. Okay, this is a batting. Um, it is fusible on one side. Yeah, this is 24 inches wide. So this is right here, the inside here. I'm gonna I'm gonna take my my topper and I'm going to iron it to that, and then I'm going to put the backing on, and then I'll probably stitch that down. So I have fusible um, table runner. If you need some of that, or if you would like to try some of that, we do have it for sale in the store. Just type in. Um, Quilter's Dream under the search bar, and you'll find that fusible table runner batting. We sell a lot of it in here because it's really inexpensive. It's like $4.99 for a yard. Um, a yard is more than what more than enough. So I love it because it's very thin. It's not going to be poofy, and it, you can quilt through it like butter. So um, it's not that cheap, slubby. Uh, batting that you can get from like a big box store that has like bunches of clumps of like crazy bats put in it like ugh, no okay so we're gonna set this seam we have the one side on okay batting is an important part of our quilting process and we want to make sure that we use good batting okay so we're gonna press that Again, setting that seam, very, very important. Look how nice that looks. Yay. I don't want a project comes together. 
We're going to do this side. Now I did mention, I think at the beginning, that I did pre-cut all my stuff um, over the last couple of days um, so that the process for you guys would be seamless. All right. Um, I find that if I do that for most of my projects, I pre-cut as much as I can, and then I kind of label everything, I tend not to get lost, and my projects tend to move along fairly nicely. So um, maybe pre-cutting is for you. Uh, it might help really reduce a lot of uh, frustrations. So, and if you have... Uh, the time then you don't feel rushed then you're more likely to look at him he sat there and he he said nope I'm not gonna do what you want I'm gonna go this way sometimes those seams they tend to move all right anyway uh, pre-cutting might be a good thing uh, just because you're very organized you have all your it's all done in your steps and it's a seamless then sewing project. You're not sitting there stopping to cut, stopping to cut, stopping to cut. Um, and then when you come back to it, if you did get interrupted, you kind of already have everything and you know exactly where you were at that time. So it's one of those like beneficial things to kind of not lose your place in line, so to speak. He is still trying to, okay, sorry. Um, so pre-cutting might be in your future. Maybe it's something that you've never tried before and this is the year you're like, you know what, I'm gonna pre-cut all my pieces first and get myself super duper organized. I have a lot of friends that um, come into class with, well, when we had classes in person, they came in with their sandwich baggies or their quart size sandwich baggies and uh, had all their little pieces ready to go, labeled, labeling is important. All those little things that you're maybe not thinking about, and then like you take a class, you're like, oh, I never thought about that. And you know, without the, the benefit sometimes of being in a class and seeing what everybody else is doing, you might never ever think about it. So that's why we're trying to do these classes so that you can, you know, have better, maybe better experience. Maybe you've learned something that you've never ever heard of today, and you're just like, oh, well, that makes complete sense. Um, Classes are important. Yeah, I don't, you know, and I know many of you, you guys are, some of you guys have been quilting longer than I've been on the planet. And that, and you know a ton. Um, but there's always something to learn because there's a lot of instructors that are still sharing tips and tricks out there. Like uh, the one thing about setting the scene, that, that comes from Martingale. Um, Martingale is a company that produces a lot of the quilting books and they had a an author that uh, she taught a lot of classes and she was explaining why we set seams um, how important it is and uh, you know there's definitely something to be said for you know these writers that are making a lot of these books and stuff they have a lot of experience things to share so we try and pass that on to you we want you happy happiness is important. Okay. Again, notice how I had this whole length pinned in. Very, very important that you pin in long lengths. I know it takes extra time and I know that you're just trying to to get it finished, but you're going to end up sewing it twice. Um, unsewing takes just as long, if not longer, and um, you're going to really want to make sure that you have that. Okay, last bit here. We have a semi-piano key border. I know we're going over our class time, my apologies. All right. So we're gonna set that scene. There we go. Yeah, the border is kind of funny. It's like a variation on a piano key border. A piano key border, for those of you that are new or maybe don't know, uh, is where there's like little rectangular strips that they sew together side uh, along the long sides. And okay, so here's this. Right, so far so good. Yep, hopefully you're at this point. So piano key border 
would typically go this way, okay, where you have your little strips, and they and they go, and you can do that, and I think that'd be really stinking cute. Um, our instructions call us to sew end to end this way, okay, for our for our border. So we're gonna just put those together, and then there's a set of six, and a set of five, and I separated them out last night, so I went to be confused. So we're gonna sew these together. This will take, and again, we're gonna sew this in um, little sets. So it's little sets of five, and we'll attach them on the sides. I don't want to put two polka dots together. That'd be liquid. So you can do a variation of this, like just because uh, she did it this way, where she's going short end to short end, you can do side to side and piano key those borders in. That'd be a nice variation. Notice that a lot of this is just choices. What choice do you want to make today? All right, put that in there. Still good? Yep. So good. And grab my little storks. See how uh, just a small pair of scissors is all, all you need right now. You don't need like these massive eight inch blade. Here, let's cut completely this tiny little string with this massive eight inch blade. I always, when I taught kids, I always tried to encourage their parents to get them storks for next to the sewing machine because little kids, being that they're little kids, um, tend to not have the same, you know, small motor skill sets that us adults tend to have. and. The idea of them with 8 inch blades with the sewing machine was unnerving, to say the least. Good night. Who knows where those blades could fly around and cut. So, I always had my, my kids in class with storks. Better for small, small hands and, and that kind of thing. Alright, so we have a variation of a piano key border here going. Almost done. Table talker looks like it's happy. Hopefully you're happy. I really hope you're happy. Hopefully you guys are. Why do we set the seams? Okay, so Sharon, we set seams to um, get that thread that we just sewn onto the fabric or into the fabric. We get that so it shrinks that thread because um, we want that to all be the same shrinkage. Okay. So let me make sure I get, you guys can see here. Um, so we set every, every one of those seams, and we're just gonna set, set, set. Okay, this is before we press this open. Shrink that thread down, and now it is all uniform with the shrink rate of our our fabric. Okay, so now we're just gonna press. Press. Make sure they all go the same direction. That's fun. All right. Helps everything be nice and flat. Flat, flat, flat. I get nervous at this part because I'm like, oh, I just sewed all those strips together. I hope they're gonna actually like work on the edges because the edges look so nice right now. But this is what the instructions said, so she hasn't been wrong this far in her instructions. Her instructions, like I said, the reason we chose this project is because the instructions are really well written and uh, we want you successful. We don't ever want to pick a project that it's like next week's mug rug. I've done that project. Uh, it turns out really nicely. We're going with it. All right, so these two I'm going to set aside because these are my fives. Now we're going to sew our sixes. I don't know why I didn't sew the sixes with the fives at the same time. I kind of broke my own rule there, but uh, that's okay. So we have these little six, six pieces. Yeah, so next week's class is the mug rug. That won't take nearly as long to do. It's a much smaller project. You will need, um, and I put this out in the description, hopefully you have the log cabin trim tool to do this class because um, next week's class needs that tool. Um, now, 
if you can try and do the class and just do a modification of it where you're doing your own uh, strips and all that, have at. I don't have the instructions to do it that way. I only have the instructions using the log cabin trim tool. So if you need one, um, I'm not even sure at this point if I can absolutely have it in time for class. My vendor's shipping is like seven business days. It is nuts. So uh, you can still take the class because it's free, you know. And you might decide after watching the class, oh, I really want to have that. And, um, and then we can order one in for you for sure. And that way you can have one. So uh, it's not something that you have to make today's decision on or anything like that. It's just letting you know that in order to do what that is that we're doing next week, um, you have to have the tool. So, like I said, unless you're really smart and you can figure out how to do it without it, like, cool, I think that's awesome. I'm not uh, going to, because if basically you're finishing with a six inch log cabin. So if you can figure out between now and next week how to do a six inch log cabin in time for class without the tool, cool. Then you, you know, then you participate in class and, and you still have a cool mug rock. I think that's awesome. Um, like I said, some of you might already have the tool at home because you guys have taken classes before and have used that log cabin trim tool. That is from Creative Grids. That is the one we're talking about um, for next week's class. So some of you guys already have it. You know that. We, we sold a lot of them. Uh, we still sell a lot of them, but uh, I am sold out. And like I said, I won't have them. Um, like, I'm not even going to try and risk saying, oh yeah, we'll have it in time for your class. Not with the way shipping's been. I know people that are still getting Christmas cards. And, matter of fact, I got a Christmas card. I got two Christmas cards last Friday. Go figure. It is, what, January, like, 8th last week? I got a Christmas card. Two of them. And, and here's the kicker. You ready for this? It wasn't like it came from Australia. The one came from Delaware. The other one, okay, and I'm in Pennsylvania, okay, so like Delaware's right next door for those of you that are not up on your geography. Um, the one came from Delaware. I know you guys are probably laughing right now. The other one literally came from across uh, two towns over from me. Like literally was two towns over. I, and I'm like, you guys seriously? It's January 8th and UPS is that backed up. So uh, that's why I'm not making any guarantees on getting rulers to anybody between now and next Tuesday because I don't need anybody upset because I can't control the postal service. I'd love to, <laughs> trust me, but it isn't in the cards. So, all right, last borders, we're done. Here we go. You guys still with me? All right, here we go. You guys ready? Shipping has been horrible. Can I use the paper piece log cabin? Jerry, you can. If you can get that to come out at uh, six inches or six and a half, I believe it is. Um, I have to go back and look at the instructions. I believe it sets at six. Well, hold on. The trim tools, I have one in front of me. I know you guys are like, Kimberly, you're just in the middle of talking. Okay, so the trim tools, this, it would, it would, this is the eight. Right, right now I have in my hand. Um, so the six inch log cabin trim tool would finish that block at six and a half. And then once you sew the seams in, it would finish at six. So yeah, if you, Jerry, if you can do it, I think that's great. Terry, my niece still hasn't received her Christmas card. <laughs> she might never at this point. <laughs> I hate saying that, but like, honest to goodness, it, I feel so bad because I've had customers that you know, I, I'm like looking at stuff that has sat in Pennsylvania. It sat in Pennsylvania for two weeks. And I'm like, why is it sitting here? It should be way out to Wisconsin by now. It does not make any sense to me that, you know, we have these these things just sitting. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. All right. So here we go. Does she have us trim this at this point? Because mine is not the same. I better go back and look real quick. Because, well, unless she did it like this. But still, mine is not the same. And I know I cut my walk straight. Okay, so. We're going to check the instructions. Because I might have to do a little trim here. 
just hasn't received her Christmas card. Oh, that's unbelievable. All right. So the one and a half inch two of the strips for five. The other one is six. The opposite size. You'll need. You will have excess fabric. There it is. She says so. This is why we use her instructions. I trim some from each end. This is why we read. I try and tell this to lots of the men and men are in my life, and I mean that by my husband and sons. Not that I have men in my life, but I have three sons and a husband. Instructions are important to read, and you know. So this she clearly says in the instructions that ours are going to overlap and that we are going to have some to trim off. This being a small project, I highly doubt it's going to get wonky on me at this point. So um, I'm going to do a method here. Let's see. I'm going to divide and conquer. Let me turn this so you can see. So what I'm going to do so that I kind of have it even on each end. I'm going to find the middle of this strip set. Now, it doesn't say to do this, but this just comes from me doing things, like, over the course of years. And, all right, we're going to find the center of the table topper. And we're going to flip this over so it's right sides together. Flipping's important. Okay. And I'm going to pin this in. Um, I'm laying it flat. I'm going to pin this in because I'm going to have a little bit of excess here and I'm going to have that. I want the same excess on the other end. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense to you. I don't want to have where I have a whole log here and like this much on the other end. That would look weird to me. So we're going to go ahead and do this and we'll sew this down. Yeah, so guys tend to not read directions. I know you guys are shocked hearing that. I know that the across America just now, everybody went, what? in a collective unison, um, but, and I'm not knocking all guys, I'm not. I love my husband and I love my sons very dearly. However, they don't read directions. It's just a thing. Um, I don't know if it's a male thing because like they think they need to know or they don't want to like look weak in front of us girls, whatever it is, they don't read. I, however, read everything because I'm more afraid of making the mistake and having to do it twice, so we read. That's what I meant by the comment of all the men in my life, because I'm talking about husbands, my husband and my sons. You may have the same experience in your household where you might have a male that you live with that does not, for some reason, read instructions. And they're really great guys. It's not that they're bad. It's just they don't want to take that extra minute. I'd rather go find out. So that's just me. That's what makes me me. All right. Waiting for comments. I ordered back in November an advent calendar for my granddaughter. She got it the first week in January. She will have it for Christmas. <laughs> well, the good news to that, Carol, is the fact that it wasn't an advent calendar for just 2020. So you, she has a early Christmas present coming, which is hilarious. Sad at the same time, but you have to really wonder what happened. Like, they raised our shipping rates right before Christmas, back in November. They raised our shipping rates because they needed to hire more people. But I guess a friend of mine, whose husband works at one of the facilities here, said that they had, I think, two million more packages come through this year, I think, than normal years. So, Carol, that's probably why it's somewhere not at your niece's house right now. Two million packages. I mean, that, that that's that's quite a bit. That's quite a bit. You know, that's a lot. So, I would suspect that probably has something to do with it. And that's just here in Pennsylvania. I mean, and we do have a fairly good sized population in Pennsylvania. It's not like Rhode Island. Um, so imagine other states that have even more population than us. I mean, I'm sure that they're male facilities, but yeah. So. Hopefully she still gets her advent calendar. I am a little concerned over some people's um, not getting their stuff at all. That is really not good. But the Christmas card thing was hilarious. So I'm like, really? She's like two towns over and just not getting the card. And I know she didn't send it late because I checked to see because I'm like, oh, well, maybe she forgot and just, nope. She sent it before Christmas. Two towns. Like, I could have walked there and back probably in a day. That's how far we're talking about here, so. Okay, enough lamenting about the shipping, okay, because some of you guys might work for USPS, and I do respect your jobs. 
I think you guys have a lot of a lot of headache with working with public and us. All right, so here we have both sides sewed. Okay, so we're gonna hit that with best press. We're gonna set that seam again every single time we're setting that seam. Notice that I have not trimmed my ends yet. There is a reason I have not trimmed my ends. I want this seam to be absolutely set before I take scissors to it. So at this point, um, I'm going to hit this with the start or this best press. Starch the heck out of it, whatever you're going to do. Make sure that that is just as crisp as possible. Okay. And then if you notice here, I am actually, I fold that actually folded under. And we're going to do this. And I do apologize for the late hour, everybody. I know that we said two hours. Okay. And at this point, um, I could either rotary cut this or take scissors to it and just trim it. That being said, I could also just leave it on there. But when I put the other piece down, it's going to interfere with that. So if you are good enough to eyeball, I'm trying to think if I have scissors up here that are yeah, bigger than my storks. I do. Okay. So at this point, okay, if you are good enough to eyeball, eyeball it. If not, um, put it down and you can put a ruler against it and rotary cut it. All right. We'll calculate the seams. This is exciting. All right, same thing, other side. We're going to press this in, set that seam before we trim off those ends. I want that, that, that stiffness of the fabric is going to make my blade of my scissor uh, not push that fabric around. That's why we want to press that in. All right. Oh, I'm going to press off that seam. And we're going to make sure that we're not ironing. We're not going back and forth. What I did there, that got all messed up up there. Okay, if you do this, hit it with your spray, get that to relax. Okay, make sure that's flat before you cut it. All right, trim that. Okay. You may say, Kimberly, how do you have such confidence to cut off that edge without a straight edge? Well, Quick story. Years ago, back to the working with interior design designers and drapery days, uh, I had an interior designer that ordered. Again, we're going to fold this in half. I'm going to stop for just a second. Okay, found the center of that, found the center here, and I'm going to pin that down just in case you're just joining me late. Okay, so anyway, I had an interior designer that ordered fabric from Germany. And we we're going to be making drapes, and the fabric wholesale cost was $54 a yard, wholesale. And I got the fabric here. It got here from Germany. We had waited six weeks for the fabric. It was gorgeous. Yup, was it worth $54 wholesale cost per yard? So retail would be in 108 Okay, for those of you that may not understand that when we do this, um, you double, okay? So $54 wholesale, $108 retail, and I had the bolt arrive from Germany, it came here to my workroom, and I'm looking at this going, hmm, I have to cut eight panels out of this, and I have to make sure that all the little elephants are in the exact same spot on all eight panels, because remember we talked earlier about custom work and how that is. So I walked around my cutting table. My cutting table at the time was 12 feet long because we do panels. And I walked, I laid it out, and I had checked my math, had my husband check my math, um, because when you do panels, blah, 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 there's math involved. It's not my fun subject. So I walked around that panel laying out on that table probably for about an hour before I decided to finally make the first cut because, one, I did not want to reorder the fabric from Germany and wait another six weeks if I messed it up. And two, I didn't want to spend $54 a yard on elephant fabric. 
because then I would have had to, you know, eat the cost instead of my designer. So, hence, the long story to this is the fact that I finally did cut it. Everything went well. I made the panels. Cool. Neat. They had elephant in their living room. And, therefore, this makes this decision to cut off those ends without a ruler kind of simple. I kind of know if I can cut it straight or not just by experience, but I also know it's not going to cost me $54 a yard if I make an oops at this point. So I have a little bit of confidence there. So if you can confidently cut the ends, cut the ends. If you can't, get a ruler. That's okay too. All right. There's no, there's no, oh, well, I have to get off the ruler. Well, I, I don't want to. Just whatever you're confident in doing. But that's why I was confident enough because when you part to the scale of is this going to run me $54 from Germany per yard, I think I can deal with it. So we're not talking that much. Okay. Maybe you've had a similar experience where you've had to cut into something. I will tell you, I was shocked and amazed the other day. Somebody was, somebody had... No, many of you might know who Tula Pink is. Some of you are quilters. You probably do. Somebody had up for an auction, I guess. Tula Pink fabric that is no longer in print. And from what I understand, from what I read, the fabric was auctioned off. And I believe it was two prints. So it's two out of print Tula Pink prints. All right. Um, and those of you that follow Tulip Pink probably know this already because you follow. Um, they had, I think it was a yard or two. It wasn't like 10 and it certainly wasn't like a bolt. It was a yard or two of Tulip Pink fabric that was auctioned off. You guys ready for this? It was $2,547. Somebody had bought this out of print Tulip fabric for and I'm like, wow, okay. So that way trumps my $54 a yard elephant fabric. I would not want to ever cut that fabric. I can't imagine cutting it apart, making it into a quilt. That's just me. But can you imagine spending $2,500 on a couple yards of fabric? Um, and hey, you know, that's teach their own. I think that's just fine if that's what they want to do. I'm just not so sure what pattern would ever be worthy of me cutting into $2,500 worth of fabric um, to make a quilt. Like, I just, I just don't know. I don't even think I could make that decision. I'd be like 10 years trying to decide the perfect pattern for that. How about you? What do you guys think? Okay, so both of those are on. We are there. We are there. Congratulate yourself for sticking through to the end. You've done it. We are at the point. Okay. Watch that. Magic pin bowl. Love the magic pin bowl. Nobody's going to come out and feel magic pins in their feet. Not that this is my sewing room. We're out in the shop. But All right. Flip this back. Look how beautiful that is. All right. And hopefully you are right at the same part I'm at in my, my progress here. Oh, that cord. Irony cord. You know what they need to do? They need, need to make a now they probably, they probably have, because they need to make a cordless iron, probably have. I was thinking of a Bluetooth vacuum cleaner the other day. How cool would it be to not have the vacuum cleaner attached to the wall? I'm so tired of tripping over the vacuum cleaner cord when I vacuum. I know they have those like, what do they call them, uh, Roombas or whatever, where they go around and they vacuum for you. I'm not there yet. I still vacuum, but it would be nice not to have the stupid cord. That's just my thing. Okay, cool. How cool is that? All right, other end. All right, we're down to the last little minutes here. Hopefully you guys are right at about the same place. If not, that's okay. You are probably far enough along that at this point, you're just going to be able to finish it up. So we're going to open that up. And again, if you are joining me for next week, um, it's still one o'clock. We're making the heart mug rug. Smaller project will not take us nearly as long. Um, it's free class. 
which I hope that you guys will join me for. I think that will be fun. I'm debating on the Zoom thing. I, I kind of like this because I'm not distracted with too many people. I can answer questions in this and keep sewing. Zoom, I'm not sure how. I would have to have Leah here for Zoom, I think, because I think she'd have to have, like, somebody'd have to be watching and talking to everybody, because I cannot, I cannot talk and sew at the same time very well. Like, I can do this, but not to, like, 30 people. Can't do that. All right, so let's move this back. We have our beautiful, beautiful table topper ready to go. And I think that it has been a success. Hopefully, you have had a successful uh, class today and your table topper is looking similar or almost done or is done. Um, I think it's been a fun project and I do appreciate you guys coming out and taking the time. So real quick, if I was going to stitch in the ditch, let me see if I can find something to kind of point that out. I'd be stitching, I hold this up for you. I'd be stitching right next to that seam, right, right along there. Okay. Some people go right into the seam. That's fine too. That's stitch in the ditch. All right. Hold on. Hello. There's the pen. Stitch. Well, I'm back too far. Oh, back too far. Here we go. We'll just do this. So you'd be stitching right along here for stitch in the ditch. All right. If you're not going to do that, you can just do a free motion all over. Um, you can just kind of swirl that all around. So you're going to layer your backing, your batting, and all that right, right together. Make a sandwich and then quilt it and then throw some binding on that. So hopefully um, you guys will still be able to finish your project. Mug rug is next week, Sharon. Yes, absolutely. And um, thank you for joining me. I, I really hope you, you had a good time. Uh, definitely leave comments and let others know. And um, Friday night, I will be back here live uh, for our fabric show. That's at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So if you are going to join me Friday night, I'd really love it. Make sure you stop and say hi. Today's coupon for class is heart. So if you would like to pick up a couple of things from class, uh, use that coupon at checkout, and you're going to get 10% off. Shipping is $5 up to $75. After that, it's free. And I'm really excited that we did this together. I think this went really well. And um, I hope you had a really good time. And if you have any more questions, please let me know. You can always reach me by email at pitsewing at gmail.com. And um, in the meantime, uh, put up pictures of your completed uh, projects. I'd love to see show and tell. And you can always join my VIP page here on my Facebook page and post your pictures in there. And uh, I, I think it would be really exciting for everyone to see how, how everyone else did. So, again, thank you uh, for, for staying with me for these three hours. Sorry it went a little long. Um, and I will see you guys Friday night. So 7 p.m. Eastern Time, Friday night, right back uh, here on my Facebook page. And we'll, we'll have some fun together then, too. So thank you again, and, and take care. Have a good rest of the evening, everyone. Bye-bye.